had a whole thing planned and I forgot to like put myself on screen. Hello, my friends. And thank you so much for coming to spend part of your Sunday, April 14th with me. Well, uh, one more day and a wake up, as my kids used to say before we went on vacation, one more day and a wake up. Anybody know what that means or have you heard that before? It is uh, what we say when we can't wait for something to get here. One more day and a wake up and jury selection will be beginning on Tuesday, April 16th, 2024 in what very well may be one of the biggest trials in recent history. If anyone else can point me in the direction of a criminal trial that is going to get more attention than this one, tell me. I mean, I, you know, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, that was a civil trial, so we can't even count that one. What I'm going to say, all right, I'm just going to say it. Orenthal James Simpson could not have died at a better time for the Karen Reed case because everyone is remembering what happened during the OJ trial all the way back in 1995. Anybody remember? I know maybe some of you people might be, some of my friends might be too young to remember. But, you know, in addition to a few other events in my life, I do remember where I was when the O.J. Simpson verdict came in. And it was the same year that Jerry Garcia died. This was in 1995. Jerry Garcia died in August and the O.J. Simpson verdict came out, came down in September. And there was a ton of evidence against him, including DNA and all kinds of things. OJ was acquitted because of, anybody remember why? Anybody remember what it was about Mark Furman? The allegation was that Mark Furman, the detective planted evidence that there was police corruption in this case in addition to some other issues with Mark Furman, but he was the glove, the glove. If it didn't fit, you must have quit. How about this? If Chloe bit, you must have quit. I'm taking credit for that. Um, was it October 3rd? In, a, in any event, same year, 95, right? I thought it was some, sometime, something happened in September. I was looking at it. I've, I've been off the grid for the weekend because you know, I have to be present for my kids and my kids always come first. So this weekend we were doing a college visit for one of my twins to see if that is where she wants to go in September. And she has found her happy place. And I'm happy to report that she has made her decision. Now I just have one more twin <laughs> to get a firm decision on. And, uh, that's what we were doing. And I, we were at a historic hotel that did not have the greatest Wi-Fi. But then one of my viewers gave me a great tip to use the hotspot on my phone. And I thought, no way am I going to be able to stream using the hotspot on my phone. But it worked because last night I did a stream for about an hour and a half with breaking news on the tragic story of the, oh, the Kansas moms who went missing in the Oklahoma panhandle. Um, Veronica Butler and Jillian Murphy and uh, four people have been arrested in that case. They are confirmed dead and they, all four of them have been convicted or I'm sorry, have been charged with murder, kidnapping and conspiracy to commit murder. And one of the four, two of the four were the ones that I predicted, the grandmother of the children and her boyfriend. And it is like, it is like no man's land in the Oklahoma panhandle. And if you haven't been following that case, it's crazy. The stream from last night was great. Rock Chalk joined me. She was uh, boots on the ground looking for these women in Oklahoma because nobody else was. She saw my first show on this case on April 2nd. And the next day she got in her truck, drove from Wichita with two horses, two working dogs, two guns, and herself. And she went down there to search for these women. And she has some fascinating tales about the people that she spoke to and how people were so petrified to talk about this case. But finally, two weeks after they went missing, the arrests were made. And um, we do not have any information on whether any remains were found yet. So 
Um, just talking a little to let everybody have a chance to get in here. And um, all right, so I've been gone for the whole weekend, you guys. What did I miss? What did I miss? <laughs> I literally was in a hotel lobby trying to watch this pre-trial hearing on it was Friday, right? On Friday. Uh, in a hotel lobby, trying to get Wi-Fi. People are eating breakfast around me. I'm trying to tell people to shh because I'm trying to listen to the hearing. And uh, Oblivious Benson texted me uh, later in the evening and she said, girl, I'm just doing a wellness check on you. Like, are you okay? Because Karen Reed had a crazy hearing today and I don't see you on YouTube. And uh, that's when I realized I tried. I went up to my room. I tried to get it set up. I was like, this is not going to be able to handle streaming for as long as I want to stream with sharing screens and everything. So I think the airways were kind of, uh, kind of crowded on Friday night anyway. So, uh, here we are on Sunday and I hear that tomorrow is a holiday in Boston. Tomorrow's the, the Boston marathon and it is Patriots day, right? And also a very sad reminder of the Boston marathon incident that happened all those years ago. This show, again, is brought to you by Maureen Francis, who, again, with the cap, Cash App, got in there even before the show started. So thank you so much. And thank you, Carrie, so much for your super sticker and to Dennis, who became a new member. This is this is getting crazy, you guys. Um, yeah, eventually, so I knew you guys were looking for me, and I got so many emails and so many messages, and I'm so happy that you missed me. That's really, it makes me feel good that you missed me. That's great. Um, but it just couldn't happen, so I put a post up that I was going to try and do it on Saturday. I thought, you know, let me get, wait until I get home. I'm settled in my regular space and, and we can uh, talk about this after you all have probably watched the hearing at least 10 times each, right? Yep. I know it. I know I'm a spoiler for anybody who hasn't seen it yet. Um, it's crazy. So who wants to watch the hearing again with me this time? You want to watch it again? Yep. There's a proffer. There's a proffer involved. And this is so crazy. Wait, did you, before I even get into like, we're going to play the hearing and we're going to look at it together and I'm going to stop it. I'm going to yell and scream and make jokes. And uh, there is nothing funny about this at all. Nothing funny. But um, we need to sometimes make light of things or we will cry. And um, just because of the craziness that's going on around us. And when I, when I watch what's going on um, with the Twittyets over there, I'm just, I, I'm amazed every single day. I'm just amazed. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I, it's just so obvious to me. I, I just, so thank you all for, you know, making me feel like I'm not crazy um, because it's whack. Thanks, San. <laughs> Sandy B, thanks for your super chat. We just really missed you. Thank you so much. <gasps> and I'm glad that you waited for me. So, so let's watch it again. And uh, has anybody seen, did you guys see the court TV piece with Julie Grant? Did anybody else play that for you? Because I have not watched anyone else's coverage. I like to come to you fresh with my own ideas and opinions about these hearings. Yeah, Brandy, I, Brandy was getting it bad. Brandy, are you here tonight? Because nosy Rose said Brandy hid from the twits. Um, Twittiots, twits. Well, it's really one more day in a wake up, right? Because... This day's almost over. And then we just have tomorrow. And then we wake up and it's Tuesday. Yeah, I felt bad for Brandy because Brandy is like a sweetheart. And she she doesn't even get like I get passionate about it. I mean, I know why people are coming after me because, you know, I mean, it's not that I'm an easy target. But I mean, you know, people hate lawyers. <laughs> Let's just call it what it is. Um, but Brandy is nothing but a sweetheart who does everything she possibly can for her viewers and for everyone. Okay, so you guys have not seen this Julie Grant piece with um, Wendy Murphy? It might make you crazy, but I might play it just so that you could hear it. Um, yeah, I have watched the hearing. So yeah, uh, let, oh, hello, Billy. Thank you for being a new subscriber. We love everyone, the Twittyettes. Yeah, I'd like to be a tweetheart, but apparently <laughs> there's no such thing over there. It just doesn't exist. So I do not, I don't engage. I, I think people just want you to engage with them because it makes them feel important. And I'm not going to do that. I'm just not going to do it. I'll go there for breaking news. When I was covering, and I still am going to cover the Oklahoma story 
uh, that's where the breaking news comes. Although OSBI seems to like to put their stuff out on Facebook, which I hate, but we will, uh, we will get there. We will get there. All right. Let us start to watch this, uh, this hearing. And then what I'm going to do is when Lally or Mr. Lally or counselor Lally or my brother starts talking about the video, I want to go straight to the video which is in part two, because remember, uh, she said, can you bring me that back this afternoon? And then they watched the video and I was waiting for so much more than there was, but I want to hear what you guys have to say about that. So let's just, let's just dive right into it. Um, let's go. Let's go. One more day and a wake up. This is part one. This is part one. All right. Let me know that you can hear this when we get going. I'll, ca- I'll put the captions on for those of you who, uh, but just don't rely on the captions because they're so bad. When I was watching the other day, they were talking about motions in limine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Scott. I will. I'm going to slow the chat down. Great idea. Um, it was coming up on the screen as motions in lemonade. So now I'm just calling them motions in lemonade because, uh, that is what the closed captions will get you. <laughs> All right, hang on one second. Scott, you think this was bad? Scott, were you here last night when we had 8,500 people in the chat? I, I, the chat was moving so quickly that I couldn't see which mods were there and which weren't. But I think the Pranzos were there. A little, I think uh, Shona's Glow was there. But that was crazy. Uh, well, why can't I find the place where I got to slow it down? All right. We're going to go to slow mode, you guys. So you have to wait 30 seconds to send a message just so everyone will get the opportunity to talk. All right. Better. Better. Yeah. Everybody hit the like button. Thanks. <laughs> Scott's on top of it. He's like, you might want to slow it down because, um, you know, we never know what we're going to get when we start talking about this case. We never know what we're going to get. But we're here for it. We are here for it. And I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this. Okay. There they are. The fantastic, the fantastic four, the dream team. I don't know, whatever you guys want to call them. But um, I, there's something else I want to talk about too. And just somebody confirmed for me that I'm not crazy, that Alan Jackson... And his firm did not become involved in this case until September 22, correct? September of 2022. Because that is when they have them filing their Pro Hoc Vice motion in court. So a lot of things we've been seeing flying around on in the Twitterverse are uh, incorrect, incorrect, incorrect. Thanks, Pete Apranzo, one of my amazing mods. We broke our record last night. Yes, we did. We had a packed house. We had over 8,500. By the time that stream was done, by the time we I hit end stream, we already had something like 80,000 views. It was crazy. It was crazy. I mean, nobody else was covering it. So, all right, here we go. Magnolia Gypsy, a lot of people are hate viewers. You have to understand that too. (laughs) But that's okay. We welcome them. Just hit the subscribe button and we're happy to hear what you have to say. Just keep it classy. Not hard. Judge 22 CR 117, the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Can I have counsel identify themselves starting with the Commonwealth? Adam Lally for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Lally. Good morning, Your Honor. Laura McLaughlin for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Ms. McLaughlin. Good morning, Your Honor. Alan Jackson on behalf of Ms. Reed. Good morning, Mr. Jackson. Good morning, Elizabeth Little, also on behalf of Ms. Reed. Good morning, Ms. Little. Good morning, Your Honor. David Unetti for Karen Reed. 
Good morning, Mr. Yanetti. Good morning, Ms. Reed. All right, so to begin, and I have all the motions in limine. Um, I'll talk about how exactly we'll go through them in a minute. Um, but first, so in reviewing the motions in limine, I mean, clearly the defendant has an absolute right, a constitutional right. I said this in my uh, thumbnail. Are they ready for their close ups? Because this camera person, what is up with these close ups? It's like we don't need to see their pores. I don't know. It's just a whack. It's a whack camera. <laughs> I hope they're not going to do that. To present a third party culprit defense, but counsel is well aware that that is not without limit, right? From the case law. Now, defendant has stood here, defense counsel has stood in this court repeatedly, um, stood here and in other venues and in the pleadings, espousing various third party culprit. Um, theories or scenarios. Um, but now that it's time to actually try the case in the courtroom, I don't have a motion from the defense to admit third party culprit uh, testimony. So, and as you're well aware, I have to make findings before any third party, any mention of any third party culprit evidence or even an opening goes before the jurors. Um, you know, in order to admit it, and given that I have no information at all, I mean, I don't know who the third party culprit is, even after reading 4,500 pages of discovery. Okay, um, we've talked about this ad nauseum on this channel. They do not have to prove anything. They don't have to prove anything. And their theory of the case, the defense's theory, could change based on how the evidence comes in. All they have to show is reasonable doubt. They do not have to prove that a specific other person did this. Potty culprit. Somebody said potty. <laughs> Where are you from, V. Oakley? Not from Massachusetts. <laughs> a third potty culprit. I love it. I love it. That's good. T-shirt time. They do not have to prove specifically who did commit this crime. They have to just, just prove or show or show some reasonable doubt that law enforcement was not interested in finding out who specifically did commit the murder of Officer John O'Keefe. Because we've been through this again ad nauseum. And the FBI accident reconstructionist has also come to the conclusion that Officer John O'Keefe was not hit by a car and a car did not hit Officer John O'Keefe. So, uh, you know, I don't know what she's doing here, but uh, let's see what they have to say about it. I don't know what motive a, a third party culprit might have. I don't know. how. Does it matter? It doesn't. They, they don't have to prove that. Again, she has been transferred to civil court and this is the only criminal case that she decided to keep her hands on. So, um. She doesn't, they don't have to prove anybody else's motive for possibly committing this crime. And basically they've been hamstrung by the judge's unwillingness to give them certain discovery that could point them in the direction of certain cell phone records that they wanted from Brian Higgins, Brian Albert, Berkowitz, Kevin Albert. I don't even know if those motions were granted. But there's a lot of stuff that's going to come out today that we didn't know that is going to blow the lid off of this. If there's any, is there anyone in the chat who doesn't know anything about this case at all? If you are in the chat right now and you're hearing this case for the first time or you're just getting started before this trial starts, um, wave to me or raise your hand or just say, Put a number one in the chat. Just write one. So I, I want to see how many people are very, very new to this case. But again, this is, I don't know. Every time I watch a hearing on this case, it makes me feel like I'm crazy. And I've been practicing a law for 30 years. I, I don't get it. 
how it's relevant. I don't know if it's remote or if it's current. I don't know if it's speculative um, or if it's relevant. I don't know if it will prejudice uh, or confuse the jury. And if it's hearsay, I have a whole other series of factors I have to consider. So, Mr. Yannetti, are you pursuing a third party culprit defense? Uh, we are, Your Honor, and I'm prepared to address that. The Commonwealth has raised the issue, and I am prepared to address that today. So you filed your motions first, and you did not raise it. So if the Commonwealth had not raised it, you did not move to introduce it, correct? I have no motion from. No, I from understand. You about it. I understand. He, he's, he's speechless, too, because like me, he's now thinking to himself, like, am I missing something? Am I insane? He's a very well-known, renowned criminal defense attorney from the Boston area. This is not his first trial. This is not his first day in a courtroom. But even he is speechless. I, I, okay, I'm sorry, Counselor, that this is happening to you. We are all feeling your frustration as well. Dan, Your Honor, um... If you'd like something in writing for us, we can do that. I have a full argument prepared. All right, so who is the third party culprit? We, we are under no obligation to name any specific third party culprit. How am I supposed, so you're prepared to argue all this? I'm prepared to argue it, Jeff. All right, so we will get to that when we get to the Commonwealth. He's like, uh, you sure you want to hear this, Judge? You sure you want to hear this? Because um, I don't know if you're aware, but there is a protective order from a federal court that is supposed to not allow me to say certain things in open court and on television and, you know, for worldwide, the worldwide audience, not just the World Wide web, but the worldwide audience to see, but hey, you want to hear it? I'm ready. I got it right here. Let's go. And then she's going to interrupt him in the middle of it too, which made me insane. Were you all screaming at, were you all, see, you can kind of guess where I was this weekend because I am saying y'all, were you all screaming when, uh, when she called that break and the court said, uh, I think the court reporter's hot. She needs a break. Yeah. It gets better. You guys, if you haven't seen this yet. Motion. That's fine. Now the, the second thing I want to address, because again, it's, it's very important at this point. Um, the motion regarding the DNA regarding um, excluding the DNA. Mr. Lally, why should I not allow that motion? Uh, for a couple of reasons, Your Honor. Um, number one, uh, what I can uh, provide to the court by way of up. Okay, I, I, ordinarily, <laughs> I would not point this out, but I cannot, I cannot stop looking at his hair. His hair. It just looks like, and you look, it's when my kids were little and I used to put them in the bathtub and they had bubble bath and they hardly had any hair and they would go like this and they would go like this with the soap and they would make like a little like shark fin on their head. I like, it. it's like a little baby hair. Like, is that on purpose? I don't know. I just, I need to know. I need to know. Is there a stylist involved here? I need to know. Date is um, that most of the testing uh, with regard to that item is complete. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, the item. All right, just for, just, just for, you know, something and giggles because we don't, we don't curse on this channel. Um, yeah, it, it, it's almost complete. It's almost complete. Uh, this was Thursday. Trial starts Tuesday. Um, so yeah, we have plenty of time, Your Honor, despite the fact that, you know, we have been saying for, uh, we've had this in our, in our possession for, over a year. Okay, Scott, I will, I will further, I will further slow the chat. Let's go to 60. I'm going to 60. I'm going to 60. All right, Scott. Let me know how that goes. Okay. Um, we've only had this in our possession for uh, over two years. Losing track of, of, of years here. So it's been two years and three months, but uh, you know, it'll be ready maybe next week. Come on. I mean, I feel bad. He He's really, he has been given the short end of the stick in the Norfolk County DA's office. Uh, Marcy did not want to be touching this thing at all. Did not want to step in. By the way, my friends who are local attorneys in Norfolk County or practice in Norfolk County or anybody who works in the courthouse in Norfolk County, 
has Michael Morrissey, since he has become the district attorney in 2010, ever tried a case in that courthouse? Or is he more of an administrative role? Like, um, like Jack, like Jack in the old law and orders. Jack McCoy. He didn't really try cases, but he just supervised the other attorneys. Let me know. People are saying not to my recollection. Okay. Admin only, says rehab department groups. Okay. All right. So he is not, okay. Suzanne says admin only, politician only. Yeah. Politician, he's a, he's a, he's a lifelong politician. We, did, we're, we went over his CV one day when we were watching the hostage video. All political. Here in Norfolk says Little Genie. Little Genie, is that like an Elton John song? You know, I think in song lyrics, you guys. So I'm here for it. Uh, here in Norfolk and nope, never. Never. Yeah, so Lally got the short end of the stick. They're like, <laughs> here you go. Run with it. Have fun. Bye-bye. Is, is hair. Uh, that was confirmed by the, the Bodhi uh, testing uh, prior to them conducting any sort of mitochondrial testing. The mitochondrial profile, uh, the partial profile that was generated in regard to the hair sample uh, is complete. The mitochondrial DNA profile in regard to Mr. O'Keefe's sample is complete. Uh, the preliminary analysis uh, that I received uh, by way of uh, email from Bodhi yesterday uh, indicated that they were consistent with each other. Uh, I asked for some sort of preliminary report or something that I could share with counsel uh, based on their uh, labs accreditation uh, that does not permit them to release anything by way of a report prior to it going through a full review process my understanding is that not only that process okay for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time you might notice that you're hearing some heavy breathing in the mic and i did it just to imitate it but it is actually the judge heavy breathing into the mic and it may freak you out a little bit, um, but like, like, like Tommy just said, I think it was Tommy who said that about the CPAP machine. I highlighted it because it was really funny. Um, and like, you just cannot even make this up. Yeah, it was Tommy who said that. Remember, <laughs> they, they sure a CPAP. Uh, you just can't make this up. I am going to, I think we should start a bingo game because there are some things that I want to have on my bingo card. Um, and we're going to talk about that later. We'll do, maybe we could do bingo cards or something. If anybody knows how to do that, um, heavy breathing, there's going to be a coffer in the courtroom. There always is. That's an easy one. Insane. Insane. Pamela the camel. I saw that I highlighted. We're going to go back to it. I am outraged. I am outraged. All right, let's not digress too much, or we're never going <laughs> to we're never going to see the end of this. But it's just you can't make it up. Yes, but the entire uh, lab file uh, should be produced uh, by Tuesday. On top of that, uh, what I would uh, state as far as any sort of prejudice uh, the defendant of ears that they've suffered as a result of that, uh, there is still zero reciprocal discovery that I've received uh, in regard to anything from counsel. And we've gone over this as well. Under the rules of court, the defendant does not need to reciprocate any discovery until the Commonwealth, for those of you who are confused um, about why we say Commonwealth, in Massachusetts is called a, a Commonwealth and not a state. So in other trials that we watch, it's the state versus the defendant uh, in Massachusetts, it's the Commonwealth versus the defendant. So the defendant in a criminal case in Massachusetts is not required to turn over any of reciprocal discovery or automatic discovery until such time as the Commonwealth has met its discovery obligations and files what is called a certificate of compliance, indicating to the court that they have indeed turned over all of the evidence that they intend to show or introduce at trial. They have not done that yet. I do not even, I still don't see it in the docket. If anyone knows if it's there, well, let me know. But so he's, he's crying because he has no discovery. He knows the trial starting on Tuesday, but he did not file his certificate, certificate of compliance. 
And then part of the delay, at least a portion of, of the delay in this specific testing, as the court is aware, uh, as you've had a chance to review uh, Bodhi Technologies uh, observance policy, as far as outside experts, there was a significant delay in hearing from counsel and, uh, for the defendant in regard to whether or not they wish to have someone present prior. How long a delay? Uh, I believe it was at least several weeks, if not a month. I mean, we spoke about it in person in December. Uh, and I don't believe that my I order was in November. Correct. So when we received uh, the, it was took a, your order was in November. What took a little time on our part was to get uh, the samples time. taken from the troopers in regard to the other testing and in order to get all of those items shipped and transported from the MSPCL to Lorton, Virginia to Bodie. When was that done? Uh, late November. Go ahead. Um, Kristen, I don't know, how could he say that he just filed it if he still hasn't handed over the DNA? I don't think, I don't know. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Oops. Then there was uh, a evidence viewing, uh, which both counsel uh, attended. We spoke about it there. I think that was December 1st. Uh, and then I waited a few weeks, never heard back, followed up on it, and eventually heard uh, back with regard to them not wishing to have anybody present for that. When was that? I, I don't have a specific date offhand, but... I need you to find it. I can't. Abra, 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 but, 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 but. So I didn't know that the defendant decided not to have somebody there. Right. And that prolonged it. They weren't able to go forward, right? Yes. No, he's, is he outright lying? Didn't he, didn't he not respond to their emails? for such a long time to Bodhi Labs, and so they did nothing? This is, this is uh, if you know, you know. How long will it take you to find that information? Um, shouldn't take too long. I just, I, I would need to check my email. All right, I'm gonna take a five minute recess. Thank Ooh, you. she's gonna make him pull, she's gonna make him pull up the receipts. Oh, Nelly says, uh, defense counsel confirmed they received the certificate. Uh, during the hearing, they're going to say that? Admittedly, I was in a very, very busy hotel lobby when I was trying to watch this. But uh, let's forward to their five-minute break. At least we know that we're going to get good video coverage of this trial because... If you're watching the Chad Daybell trial, it, it's almost unwatchable. It is so bad. It's a Zoom feed and it's grainy and the audio is terrible. And it's just, I'd rather just watch people recap it than watch the whole thing myself. What are you handing me, Mr. Lally? You know, it's an email uh, from Mr. Yanetti on December 22nd uh, confirming that they uh, do not wish to have observation for testing in the hair sample of Bodie. All right. So that was about a month after my order? Correct. All right. And the defendant's asking me to exclude this in part because of the late disclosure of the information. Yes. All right. Uh, I'll hear from the defense on this, and then I'll give you an opportunity to address it, Mr. Lally. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd first like to address the timeline that Mr. Lally has just explained to the court. Okay, I think he's got a focus issue. I think he needs to learn how to focus without having to pull in so we can see her pores. Come on. Tighten up your game there, cameraman. Tighten up your game. First of all, we were not made aware that we were allowed to test based on Bodhi's protocols and procedures until December 1st. We were given a letter saying it would cost $21,000 for our expert to sit in on that testing. We, we were- $21,000 for their expert to sit in on that testing. That's not even including what they have to pay the expert to travel there, to render a report for uh, the hourly rate. Um, really? Because the MSP lab couldn't confirm that this hair was human. So the Commonwealth in their infinite wisdom decide to send it to an outside lab in Virginia that is supposed to be 
expert at this. And by the way, I believe the turnaround time on hair DNA is something like six to eight weeks. You can correct me if I'm wrong. This has been going on for years. We have watched many a hearing about this alleged human hair that they have actually released to the media is a human hair. They have gone so far as to say that it is John O'Keefe's hair that was found on the bumper. And you will see that it is not a human hair. But again, it's already out there. So there are some people who have repeatedly said that on various news channels, talking heads. Viewed that letter. We told Lally, the, Mr. Lally, that it was most likely we were not going to have someone independently watch the testing because of the price. When was that? December first. When December first. December first. Okay. We confirmed that in writing when he emailed us again on December twenty second. And I would note for the court that Bodie did not receive the hair from the Commonwealth until January eleventh. Okay. So January eleventh of twenty twenty four. What? Yes, Kimberly, you are right. The state lab said it was not a human hair. Or the person who actually examined the hair under the microscope had failed the proficiency test for examining hair under a microscope within something like two weeks of examining the hair or the snow brush hair or the fiber under the microscope. There was no delay on our part. As the court knows, to date we have received no reports from the Commonwealth regarding Bodhi Technologies analysis of the DNA. The Commonwealth has engaged in repeated and inexcusable delays regarding the testing of this particular item of evidence, which at this point is sanctionable. The hair has been in law enforcement custody for more than two years, Your Honor. On February 1st, 2022, Massachusetts State Police criminalist, Maureen Hartnett, purportedly recovered a hair from the bumper of Ms. Reed's vehicle. For a full- Oh, I just, Eliza, just take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Don't be nervous. You're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. This is Elizabeth Little, who is, works at Attorney Jackson's office, for those of you who don't know. Alan Jackson, who has yet to speak today, is a an L.A. attorney who represented, well, he was a prosecutor and he prosecuted Phil Spector, and I believe he defended Kevin Spacey, at least Kevin Spacey, some other famous people too, maybe Harvey Weinstein at one time. Full year, the Commonwealth did nothing. Finally, on March 6, 2023, criminalist Marine Hartnett got around for the first time. Sorry, criminalist department? Is that what you said? Criminalist Maureen Hartnett. Okay, yes. Got around to conducting a visual inspection of that hair for the very first time. On March 6, 2023, she opined that it appeared to be human. However, subsequent discovery produced by the Commonwealth revealed that she had failed her proficiency test in that precise subject matter only one month prior. Then, on August 25th, 2023, the Commonwealth submitted that hair to the Massachusetts State Police Lab for DNA testing, and it was forensically determined that no human DNA was detected. No human DNA was detected. None. None, none, none. And they waited over a year before they even looked at it for the first time. Almost six months later, the Commonwealth made their third attempt to find evidence establishing that the hair was somehow probative in this case. It is now four days before trial, and we are told that we're going to receive this on the day trial is set to begin. Pursuant to Massachusetts Rule of Criminal Procedure 14C, subdivisions one and two, the court has the discretion to exclude evidence based on the Commonwealth's failure to comply with its discovery obligations. There's no excuse for a two-year delay. We immediately conferred with counsel when he notified us as to what the requirements were going to be if we decided to have an expert present for testing. We got back to him the day that he emailed us following up about that. And they didn't even bother sending the hair to the lab until weeks later. So I don't think it's fair to blame the defense for a two-year delay mm -hmm. in this regard. Yeah. As the court made...
Because the defense didn't even have control of that hair at all. <laughs> How can you blame the defense for that delay? They did not have control of that hair. They were not in possession of the hair. They were not allowed to touch the hair. They were not allowed to have their expert. And you'll see, if you're just joining us for the first time, how much trouble the defense had even getting their experts to look at basic pieces of discovery. It took years. You know, from the notices of discovery, we've received an overwhelming amount of evidence. This week, last week, the week before that, we're on the eve of trial. It is not fair to throw at us yet another item of evidence that we have to retain an expert to assess. We have to review, we have to make tactical decisions. That's not a fair position to put the defense in. We've been asking for a continuance. I think the only fair thing if the court is going to force us to go to trial is to exclude this evidence. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Lally. Yes, Your Honor, again, um, it, not faulting counsel for any sort of two year delay period, but there was a, a period of time uh, given sort of the close nature of, of when the Commonwealth is receiving this information uh, that a couple weeks uh, or a few weeks in this case uh, do matter. Uh, the other <laughs> really uh, did, did, did he just really make that argument that a few weeks do matter? I mean, I, that is just I, I can't believe people in the courtroom are not laughing. A few weeks do matter. How about two years do matter? You had this for two. You've had it for over two years. What? As far as uh, again, as far as the defendant being prejudiced, this is an evidence that I anticipate introducing in in the first day, the first week, or probably not even the first month of, of mm. trial. So, mm. uh, whatever time counsel needs uh, in order to uh, retain an expert, run that by an expert run that by one yeah let's just have trial by fire let's just be like okay you know what i'm not even going to introduce this in the first month of the trial so you've got plenty of time in addition to all of the other things that you're doing to prepare for this trial and cross-examine witnesses and everything else and uh and maybe you know I, I we won't even give it to you for like a month so you've got plenty of time to hire an expert plenty of time no worries no no budget or anything i mean your budget's unlimited right ms reed your budget is unlimited so if we just throw this at you a month from now and you got to hire another expert, I mean, give me a break. One of their experts they already have. Uh, I, I don't know that, whether or not they have any experts, because again, I don't have anything from them. Um, so as far as uh, ample time, uh, I, I would submit uh, that there's more than sufficient time uh, once the report is received uh, for counsel to make uh, use of it in whichever way they deem appropriate. Uh, and for that reason, and I'm certainly not asking the court to continue the trial date. Uh, but for that reason, I would ask that the motion to exclude be denied, um, absent any prejudice to the defendant. All right, so I, I'm going to take this under advisement. Uh, and I, I may as well tell you that the best way, I think, for us to proceed with the rest of these motions is since because they were filed so late, which I understand they were filed, just to be clear, I know they were filed by the deadlines, but uh, so close to trial, uh, I don't have written oppositions, really, unless you both raised uh, independently the same issue. So what I will do this morning is my intention is to hear um, from counsel, to hear at least from the other side if um, if the motion itself is clear enough, but to hear from counsel. Um, then we'll take a break and at two o'clock, we'll come back and anything I can decide, because I know you're preparing this weekend to go to trial on Tuesday. Anything I can decide by this afternoon, I will. Anything that I cannot, I will let you know. Um, and then um, then we'll do housekeeping, which I can, um, including, though it's certainly a very important part of the case, jury voir dire in that. So that will come at the end of, that will come this afternoon. So uh, starting with the view. Um, uh, Your Honor, I was just going to notify the court, uh, to your discretion, there are a number of motions that will be unopposed. I don't know if All right, so what I'm going to do with that is the Commonwealth filed a very helpful list of what they're um, numbers. We have, of course, the, the paper number, the docketed number. Uh, so when I get to that, we'll just go through those quickly. Whoever the court wishes. All right, I appreciate that. So, so you, well, I'm probably starting with one. You could have saved yourselves time. James Lynch, the electrician, was laughing his butt off at home watching this. It's appalling. And he says, and I ain't no lawyer, I'm an electrician. You can't make it up. You really, you just can't make it up.
we're going to start casting after this. So keep in, in, keep thinking in your head who you would cast for each of these roles in the movie. And we'll, we'll, we'll maybe we'll do a poll later. Time and writing the motion regarding the view because you both want a view. I will conduct a view. Um, you need to talk because you have different locations. Yeah, and you know, we've, uh, upon consideration, Your Honor, the Commonwealth has asked for a view of 34 Fairview Road. Um, we would be satisfied with a view of. So you don't need to go to the waterfall? We, I, I think that we can just agree to go to that one location. All right. So you all figure out the view. I am going to take under advisement your request um, of the defendant coming with us. You know that there are all sorts of things I have to consider sure. before deciding that. Thank okay? you. Okay, but so what about what about the Commonwealth's request that they want to have the car towed there and they want the jury to inspect the car? Because I don't remember her addressing this in the morning. Is she going to address it later? That part is under advisement. Um, before the end of today, figure out exactly what you want to do with the view. Um, Mr. Lally, your office will provide state police escort for that view? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Now, our court officers, Chief Rose usually gets the bus. So... All right, so for that, so the defendant's motion, it's our paper 283, defendant's motion eliminate to exclude irrelevant, inadmissible, and prejudicial prior bad character and propensity evidence. So I'll hear whoever's arguing that for the Commonwealth. The Aruba incident, if you will. Mm. I mean, I'm sorry, who, who's arguing for the defense? That's who I'll hear from. I am, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. You say 282. 283. 282. Oh, this is all backwards. Pauline did this for me. <gasps> Pauline, <laughs> Pauline is in trouble. Did you hear that? She's like, oh, this is all backwards. Pauline did this for me. Oh, poor Pauline. She just got called out on international TV. Man, Pauline's going to get it. Thank you, Hi. Your Honor. The Commonwealth seeks to admit irrelevant, inadmissible, and prejudicial prior bad character and propensity evidence against Ms. Reed by admitting inflammatory evidence of an event that purportedly transpired in Aruba on December 31st, 2021. As the court knows, this type of propensity evidence is extraordinarily prejudicial and serves no purpose other than to assassinate Ms. Reed's character in the eyes of the jury. The Commonwealth has put forth no reliable evidence to suggest that the incident that occurred in Aruba on New Year's Eve has anything whatsoever to do with O'Keefe's death or that this remote and isolated incident was even a point of contention in their relationship at the time in question. And we aren't left guessing, Your Honor. All of the witnesses who were present at the Waterfall Bar and Grill on January 29th, 2022, along with high quality video surveillance footage from that night, established that Ms. Reed and Mr. O'Keefe were happy, they were in good spirits, they were getting along. There is no evidence to suggest that this incident had anything to do with the facts at issue in this case. The Commonwealth points to purported angry voicemails left on the, defendant's, the decedent's voicemail to suggest that there was some sort of hostile relationship between Ms. Reed and Mr. O'Keefe that night. Ruby says state police escort by the corrupt state police that framed Karen Reed. This reminds me of like uh, Murdoch. Did anybody watch the Murdoch trial? When they go on a field trip to Moselle or they have like a sled is heavily involved in like, you know, doing things and sled was alleged to be <laughs> corrupt in like some of the Stephen Smith stuff. Like, yeah, it's crazy. I don't know. It's crazy. However, these voicemails were left after Ms. Reed dropped O'Keefe off at Brian Albert's residence and after he failed back to come back outside to meet her. There is no logical relationship between the prior bad acts evidence in this case that the Commonwealth seeks to admit and the crime charged here. And therefore, this evidence must be excluded. Okay, come on. Yes, Your Honor. So this also relates to uh, Commonwealth's motion to eliminate number 20. Yes. Um, so in regard to that, Your Honor, 
this is uh, highly relevant evidence as it pertains to motive and as it pertains to the nature of the relationship between Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed, uh, which uh, goes to motive, it goes to absence of accident, goes to motive, uh, as, excuse me, absence of mistake. Oh, that was uh, a, Freudian, uh, a Freudian slip there, absence of accident. Yeah, well, that's what we're saying. <laughs> There's an absence of a car accident here. Have you been watching my show? Is that what you're finally saying, Adam? Adam. His name's Adam. Like, we never call him Adam. Absence of accident. I got to play that again. It's too good. Uh, which uh, goes to motive, it goes to absence of accident, goes to motive, uh, as, excuse me, absence of mistake. Uh, and this is not a, um, as the defendant seems to uh, continuously try to pose it as, as some sort of temporary or isolated uh, incident. This isn't just <clears throat> the argument uh, or the yelling uh, of swears between uh, the defendant and uh, Ms. Sullivan in the lobby in Aruba. This then yes. leads to an argument which uh, both children indicate in their statements uh, continued inside the room in front of them for about 20 minutes after it happened. This is also not a fleeting reference in the sense that the defendant continuously brings it up on her own. Um, specifically in text communications uh, with Mr. Higgins uh, when she's talking about uh, the nature of their relationship. And it's not just the voicemails that the defendant leaves on Mr. O'Keefe's phone after uh, the murder occurs in front of 34 Fairview. It's also- I just thought of something. <clears throat> this is one that why they want to ask the children leading questions. This is why they want to ask the children leading questions. They're not children anymore, by the way. They're 13 and 16. And they want to say things like, oh, and so when you were in Aruba on New Year's Eve, um, do you remember when um, your uncle JJ and Karen came back to the room? Yes. Oh, and do you remember when they were arguing over um, when Karen thought that uh, John or JJ, uncle JJ had, um, had kissed that Marietta woman in the lobby? Do you remember that? See what's going on here? And they're going to drag these children into court to testify about this so that I'm not even going to go there, but you know what I'm trying to say. You know what I'm saying? So uh, text messages exchanged between the two of them in the days leading up to that, uh, in which they discuss the nature of their relationship. You also have statements from the children, which indicate that the victim had tried to break up with the defendant multiple times in front of them, asked her to leave the home and she refused. You also have a text communication from Mr. O'Keefe to Ms. Reed, in which he indicates that he thinks that their relationship is essentially- What was the court. date of that one? I believe that was the 28th. Uh, and then there's an other text messages uh, from. Wait, what's the 28th? Hold on. After uh, the murder occurs in front of 34 Fairview, it's also uh, text messages exchanged between the two of them in the days leading up to that, uh, in which they discuss the nature of their relationship. You also have statements from the children, which indicate that the victim had tried to break up with the defendant multiple times in front of them. Okay, so if the children are uh, 16 and 13 now, they were either 14 and 11 or like 13 and 10. And the children are going to come in and say, oh, Uncle JJ was trying to break up with her and trying to break up with her and she wouldn't let him. Really? Um, do they have the, the knowledge and the, I mean, the understanding to even testify to stuff like that. I, this really does reek of desperation. You're going to see because a lot of you did not understand the Dunkin' Donuts reference that I gave in my post from the other day, but it's in the unimpounded documents. The documents that were unsealed, the defendant's initial motion, the Commonwealth actually elicited testimony in front of the state grand jury that John and Karen were in a fight the morning of January 28th because he did not like the fact that Karen took the niece to Dunkin' Donuts on the way to school and let her have an iced coffee. And he didn't like her spoiling the children because she was buying them gifts and clothes all the time. And he wanted them to grow up more in a more simple way. And he felt that she was spoiling them. That's the fight 
that they want you to believe led to intentional or reckless murder that same evening, a fight over a Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee. Wow. Asked her to leave the home and she refused. You also have a text communication from Mr. O'Keefe to Ms. Reed in which he indicates that he thinks that their relationship is essentially- What was the important. date of that one? I believe that was the 28th. Uh, then there's an, other text messages uh, from the defendant to Mr. O'Keefe uh, referring to their relationship uh, at, between themselves and with the children as toxic. Um, <clears throat> these are further statements regarding infidelity, which continue on to the morning of, uh, in, in which statements that she makes uh, in the backseat of the vehicle with Ms. McCabe and Ms. Roberts as they're looking uh, for Mr. O'Keefe uh, just prior to, uh, to locating his body on the front lawn of 34 Verfew. Um, these are statements <clears throat> regarding uh, her belief uh, of Mr. O'Keefe's infidelity that she repeats again when she's uh, having her recorded interview with Ms. Voss from Boston Magazine. Uh, these are not isolated statements. These are not uh, just one time four weeks prior. It's not too remote in time. And it does show sort of the nature of the relationship and as it's evolving over the course of that month from the date of, of the incident in Aruba all the way through until the date uh, that Mr. O'Keefe uh, is killed. In furtherance of that also, there are statements that the defendant makes to paramedics when she's being treated on scene uh, that the last time that she saw Mr. O'Keefe, they got into a fight or an argument, and she's upset because that's the last time that they spoke was during the course of a fight or an argument in front of the house on Fairview Road. Uh, so it literally continues from the Aruba incident all the way through uh, to the murder's occurrence. Uh, so for those reasons... Oh, and the EMTs are going to testify that she said that they were arguing in the car before he died? Hmm. That's news to me. What if they're arguing in the car because she's pissed because he didn't come back to the room on New Year's Eve in Aruba and she gets there and she's like, I, come on, John, let's just go home. Like, I just want to go home. I'm tired. Let's just go home. And he wants to keep partying. And there's video of him taking a cocktail glass out of the waterfall bar. And she's like, come on, can we just go home? We don't even really know these people. We don't even really know if we're welcome here. Like, I just feel uncomfortable. And my stomach hurts. Like, I just want to go home. And he's like, no, I want to go. I want to go party or whatever. He gets out of the car. She's yelling at him. She starts driving away. And he takes the cocktail glass and he throws it at her car. And she just keeps driving. And then he goes inside and whatever happens, happens. That could explain the broken cocktail glass on the lawn. But we still don't know if that broken cocktail glass, because they called it a drinking glass when Canton PD collected it at the scene. It was a drinking glass, not a cocktail glass, by the way. And did they ever dust it for Prince? Do they even know if he was even holding that glass did they ever go in the house to see if they had drinking glasses like that in the house no they didn't i'll tell you that much um i do not think that him throwing a glass at her the rear of her car as she drove away because he was mad and she was mad and they were in a fight if that happened i don't think that would break the tail light but it's possible that that could have happened and then he went in and then whatever happened happened because everything that happened after that Leaves enough reasonable doubt to drive a truck through, in my opinion. But yeah, Nagel would have seen it. Somebody said, you're right. Nagel would have seen it. Would have seen him throw the glass. Yeah, because he pulled up right behind her. Good point. Good point, Barry Stevens. That's why I have you guys to collaborate with. The Commonwealth would submit uh, that it is relevant as to motive, it is relevant as to absence of uh, accident, and it is relevant as to absence of mistake. Thank you. All right. Um, what I will need is exactly what the Commonwealth intends to introduce. I think you've outlined it and I'm familiar with it. Um, if, if I admit it, it would certainly be accompanied by very strong curative instructions, which you know is my right. Uh, I've heard argument now. I'm going to think about this and maybe just... It's her right. You know, she's got all the rights. What about the rights of the defendant? 
What about that judge? Well, it's her right to give curative instructions. Oh yeah. Um, so if some one of those bombastic women from Aruba gets up on the stand and starts like, oh, I think Karen was a real a-hole. She was such a, a, a jerk. I just didn't like her because, you know, she wanted to come to Aruba and she insisted on having her own bathroom. So I really got a bad taste in my mouth about her because that's all in papers. We're going to look at it. I don't think she meant she had to have her own bathroom. I think that she meant that she... I think the kids were with them in Aruba, right? So maybe she wanted them to have a separate room from the kids so they could have a bathroom and the kids could have a bathroom. I don't know, but she has Crohn's, okay? So the fact that some woman from Aruba thought that Karen was an a-hole because she wanted her own bathroom is completely prejudicial, way more prejudicial than probative. It has nothing to do with this case. It was a month before but it's the judge's right to give a curative instruction to the jury. Like, oh, you know, you can like take this for what it's worth or not. Or if somebody says something bombastic, bombastic, she can just say, oh, you know, you can just uh, disregard that last sentence that the witness said. It's already out there. You can't unring that bell. Wow. Decided by this afternoon, but. Thank you. Um, does she decide it by this afternoon? Because I never heard a decision. And I never saw one get entered into the court file. So if anybody knows, let me know. Yeah. And while we're here, thank you, Maureen. Smash the like button. Mandy said, I mean, she could have thrown the glass out of the car while she was sitting there getting annoyed because he didn't come back out or answer his phone. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing. <laughs> and another thing. These women are texting him all day. John, where are you? John, where are you? John, come to the bar. John, come to the bar. And now he he's decides he wants to go in there instead of go home with her. Like, you know, I, anybody, would anybody in the chat raise your hand if you might be pissed about that? I don't know. Okay. All right, so... You were both in agreement on what's the defendant's motion to exclude irrelevant and prejudicial evidence regarding alleged harassment and or intimidation of a witness and the Commonwealth for different grounds and different scope actually. Motion to exclude mention of Aiden Kearney, AK. Kearney, really? His name's Carney. Let's get it right. Cause I can't believe that you've never heard his name before your honor. Um, and this is interesting. So listen up. If you've been, your mind is wandering, listen to this. The Commonwealth and the defense have both agreed that they both do not want any of Aiden Carney's grand jury testimony or anything involving his case, involving his alleged charges against, uh, for harassing witnesses in this case, to come into the Karen Reed trial, they have agreed they do not, neither one of them wants that in. Let's see what she's going to decide. A turtle boy and his pending criminal charges for witness intimidation. So though you both agree it's out, that doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with you that it should be out. Okay, 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 okay. What? What? Somebody said they were having problems with the volume, so I, I, I adjusted my volume. So hopefully I'm not blowing your ears out. Um. Just because you both decide that you don't want it to come in uh, doesn't mean that that it's not going to come in. I'm sorry, Your Honor. At what point did my client hire you to try her case? Are you kidding me? It strains credulity. This strains credulity. I have merch. It strains credulity. Um... I understand that the nature of her, the harassment, um, mindful of the grand jury minutes that I've read that in response to some of the questions posed by um, those at the U.S. Attorney's Office, the answers explained away some conduct as a result of the extraordinary harassment witnesses were undergoing. So I'm not sure I agree with you. So go ahead and, and try and persuade me, but is this a game? Go ahead and try and persuade me? Is this a game? Is this a joke? Am I in the Twilight Zone? I know you both agree you don't want it in, but that doesn't mean that I agree that. 
Are you kidding me? Um, what I'm inclined to do is keep it out in the case in chief, but uh, Kamala said you, you know, told your witnesses not to discuss it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll hear the defendant. Yes. yes, yes, Pamela the Camel. She basically told the witnesses to go for it. Commonwealth told me that they told their witnesses not to talk about it. Cause you know, they've had a million conferences and conference calls and meetings and interviews and all kinds of things behind closed doors, even before they testified in front of the federal grand jury with uh, Mr. Lally and maybe Mr. Marcy and who knows, but, um, what? Credulity, C-R-E-D-U-L-I-T-Y. It's like incredulous, it strains credulity. If you watch the Maya trial with me, that was a phrase that one of the attorneys liked to use in his court papers and I just adopted it. I love it. It's like an Alice in Wonderland. Strains credulity. And on my merch, I have Alice in Wonderland with that phrase, strains credulity, because I just can't believe it. Like, I just can't believe it, no matter how hard I try. I guess I would start, Your Honor, by saying that um, in order for evidence to come in, it has to be elicited by a party. It has to be offered by a party. Um, you're being told that the Commonwealth does not intend to elicit this evidence and that the defense does not intend to elicit this evidence. So I guess the question that I would direct to the court is, do you intend to follow up with questions? I'm not questioning the jury. It's clear that it may be a response, a natural response by a witness. A natural response by a witness. So, hey, all the witnesses that are watching tonight and that have watched this hearing live, because you probably did, you know who you are. All the witnesses that testified before the state grand jury and the federal grand jury and gave many interviews and statements to not only Trooper Proctor, but Sergeant Lank, some other people that you might know from weddings or high school or other places. She just gave you carte blanche. What happened to my internet? Uh oh, I'm frozen. Am I frozen? All right. Something just happened here, but we're going to keep going. Hopefully, I don't have to reboot. That neither one of you intended to get as a reason for something, right. that I'm not going to sanction the witness because I allowed the Commonwealth's motion. Sure. Uh, so, so, Mr. Yanetti, yes. so it's clearly. You try your case the way you want to try your case, and the Commonwealth decides how they want to do it. But I am not tying the hands of witnesses to natural responses to questions. So I'm taking this under advisement. If you open the door, it comes in. Well, I completely understand that, Your Honor. Um, I, I will say that I think probably, I don't want to speak for Mr. Lally, but I think- so, so don't speak for Mr. Lally. I'll, I'll hear speak for him for, in I'll a minute. I'll speak for myself then, if the court will allow me, uh, which is that, uh, if, if a, uh, a witness opens the door to uh, you know, a further explanation of this, um, that could give rise to both sides right. exploring that, which you know, I, I suppose uh, we'll deal with that when it comes, it comes right. to it. The way the motion's written, it would be prohibited and witnesses, you know, I'm not tying the hands of witnesses to natural answers that are the result of questions asked by counsel. Right, understood. Okay. Do you understand that, Mr. Lally? Well, Natural not. answers. And, and that was not my intent. Is, is, so is, feel is, free, is, right. Uh, so why did you Google Hoss long to die in cold at 2.27 a.m., Ms. McCabe? Um, yeah, but Turtle Boy harassed me. And, you know, he's he spent 60 days in jail for uh, harassing me. And, uh, you know, nothing's been determined yet in that case. But let's just bring it up in this case. Slippery slope, my friend. <laughs> this is a slippery slope. Must see TV, though, isn't it? It's Mr. Your motion reads, Mr. Lally. I understand. Uh, but it, it was more of a uh, notice that, that the Commonwealth doesn't seek to introduce any evidence of that. But at the same time, obviously, if the, the truthful and honest answer to a question that's posed of a witness references that, then, then I think it, it comes in. All right. So I think we're all.
Can anybody give me uh, a question to which that would be a truthful and honest answer? Uh, somebody said, and I, I'm sorry, I forgot who said that. I think it was Barry who said, uh, maybe if somebody says, oh, isn't it true that you were at Proctor's house? And then one of them will say, yes, we went to Tro Proctor's house because we were being harassed by Turtle Boy. Um, yeah, why were we at Proctor's house? That's what people are saying. Because it's been, it, it has been determined that they were at Proctor's house. Uh oh, curse words have been flowing in your in your head. I don't think in the chat because Brian Albert says he destroyed his film because of problematic texts which come in later. Oh, really? He would destroy his film because of people that give him texts Is that because somebody sent him a text message instead of just blocking the person. Oh my god, that's good though. That's good. Page. Neither of you intends to introduce this in your cases, but if you open the door or if it's a natural response from a witness, it comes in. You okay? All right, so Jim is 289, defendant's motion eliminated to exclude the plasma, serum plasma, the blood, the alcohol testing, or my numbers all off. That's 289. Yeah. All right. And the Commonwealth has a, a, a paragraph or two responding in one of your other motions. So I will hear the defendant on the motion regarding the testing of the blood from the hospital. This is my favorite one. This is my favorite one because if the blood is out, the DUI is out. There's no drunk driving charge. So this is important, so important. And the fact that they only, the Commonwealth only decided it was worth two paragraphs in a different response is surprising to me. But all for the alcohol levels. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. I'll be addressing this uh, with the court, with the court's permission. Um, this is number, just so we keep it clear in my head, I, I had named this number 17, dealing with the retrograde extrapolation. Okay, we don't have it as 17 anywhere. I thought that was the, the list that the, the helpful list that the common Right away, she's got to be antagonistic with him. The second he gets up there, Mr. L.A. Slick, smooth as butter, Alan Jackson, she's always got to dig at him. We don't have it at number 17. In Massachusetts, this is the way we do it. You have the privilege of standing before this court on a temporary basis with your Pro Hoc Vice motion. Am I overreacting? Commonwealth. Oh, okay. So it's so the I, right. uh, our number is 289. Right. Okay. Okay. So, oh yeah. She says our number is 289. But then later on when she starts referring to Lally's motions, because that's when I got all confused with my notes. I'm like, wait a minute, it's gotta, it's supposed to be in the 200s. And she's like, Oh, you're number seven, you're number 17, you're number really. But she's gonna give him a hard time, right? And the Commonwealth's one paragraph response is 17. But you filed the motion, so why don't we hear from you as the moving party? Thank you. Um so the Commonwealth wishes to have Ms. Reed's retrograde extrapolation records admitted over naturally a hearsay objection because the Commonwealth, their position is that they are medical records. The Commonwealth misapprehends the definition, the base definition of what a medical record is. A medical record, as the court well knows, holds a very special place in the evidence code, and that's because it's not compiled in anticipation of litigation. And for that reason and that reason only, um, they're deemed non-testimonial and, and not subject to Craw uh, Crawford and the defendant's right to confront and cross-examine witnesses or the experts behind the reports. Medical records are different than what we have here. The extrapolation records we have here are not medical records that were generated for treatment or Ms. Reed's medical history. They're the opposite. Those records were generated specifically in anticipation of litigation and in association with this criminal investigation. Thus, they are rank hearsay. 
The Commonwealth claims that the records are not produced in anticipation of litigation, stating basically uh, that during her hospitalization, law enforcement was at the, quote, beginning stages of their investigation. Um, but what the Commonwealth fails to mention or address is that at approximately 6.30 a.m. on a dash cam video, an officer, Officer Good, as a matter of fact, a Canton police officer, states to Detective Lank that he is going to, quote, unquote, section her which the court knows what that phrase means. He's going to place a whole... Okay. Okay. Are we grasping the importance of this? Wait a second. Let's go this way so we can full screen him. I'm going to rewind this because this is so important. The reason that Karen went to the hospital, and we've talked about this several times, let me just put myself full screen. The reason that Karen was in the hospital to begin with, a Good Samaritan Medical Center, I believe it's called, is because she was sectioned. We would call that a 5150 hold in New York or a 72 hour hold. If someone is a danger to themselves or others, they can be involuntarily admitted for purposes of evaluation. They were saying initially that she was sectioned because there was a mystery call, a mysterious call to the Canton PD that although the officers at the scene told Carrie Roberts to take Karen Reed home, they got a call at Canton PD saying she's suicidal. You need to send her to the hospital. Somebody called Carrie and said, bring her back to the scene. And that's when they took Karen in the ambulance to take her to the hospital. They didn't do a specific blood alcohol test. They did not send law enforcement to her bedside in the hospital to draw blood as they would normally do in a drunk driving case where there's a fatality. The blood results that they are using are the blood results from the regular blood work that was done at the hospital, like a CBC. And they took that ethanol level from the CBC and they're extrapolating it back and they're trying to make it look like she was hammered at the time of the accident. But their own lab says this is not an accredited facility for that. We don't know how the blood was drawn. So now he's going to say that on the body cam footage, the detective says, I want to section her. Let's listen to this again. Oh. Approximately 6.30 a.m. on a dash cam video, an officer, Officer Good, as a matter of fact, a Canton police officer, states to Detective Lank that he is going to quote unquote section her. Which ah. the court knows what that phrase means. 6.30 a.m. He's going to section her. They already had a plan in place. He was going to section her. That would have been before any alleged mystery call came into Canton PD. It, we have, people have been telling me that it was her father that called Canton PD. And I have been saying, I want to see the call logs because I don't think he would have called Canton PD to tell them to section her. I think that he would have tried to get there or he would have um, he would have uh, had somebody else take her to the hospital if he thought she needed medical treatment. But this is insane. That at 6.30, it's on the dash cam footage that Good says he's going to section her. They already had a plan. Thank you, Scott. Scott, one of my amazing moderators, 25 years on the job, NYPD. He knows they planned it. They held her against her will. That's right. That is right. At 6.30 a.m. And it's on the dash cam footage. And the dash cam footage is referred to in the original Canton PD reports that we went over a very long time ago on this show. So I'm going to play that again because I cannot stress enough how important this is. This shows a plan and this should frighten you, whether you're from Massachusetts or not. I'm going to take it even back to the beginning of his argument. And that is what the medical records are for, are from her being sectioned against her will. Yes, Michelle, yes. She just found out that her boyfriend is almost dead on the lawn. She was in shock, scared, freaking out, in grief, and they decide they're going to section her.
John says, wasn't she still at the scene at 648? I don't know the exact timing, but I can't wait to see this dash cam footage. This is going to make for incredible cross. How do they overcome this? The extrapolation records we have here are not medical records that were generated for treatment or Ms. Reed's medical history. They're the opposite. Those records were generated specifically in anticipation of litigation and in association with this criminal investigation. Thus, they are rank hearsay. The Commonwealth claims that the records are not produced in anticipation of litigation, stating basically uh, that during her hospitalization, law enforcement was at the, quote, beginning stages of their investigation. Um, but what the Commonwealth fails to mention or address is that at approximately 6.30 a.m. on a dash cam video, an officer, Officer Good, as a matter of fact, a Canton police officer, states to Detective Lank that he is going to, quote, unquote, section her which the court knows what that phrase means. He's going to place a hold on her medically. There you go. There it is. Bombshell number one. He is going to section her. Why? You know why. Thus, the clear intent of law enforcement hours before the blood draw was actually taken was to keep her under law enforcement's thumb as she was an immediate suspect. But there's a bigger issue, Your Honor, and that is that the parties lack the essential both. And by the way, this goes to the Commonwealth as well, the Commonwealth, but more importantly, the defense, we all lack the essential information on how the blood was actually drawn and tested. Those standardized protocols that we all get used to in the average OUI case, drunk driving case, uh, they don't exist here. Uh, the standardized protocols for reliable testing, they're tried and true, and every one of those protocols is missing or are missing, and that leaves the defense having to sort of guess at the validity of the underlying test and the validity of the underlying test is the foundation on which the extrapolation is made, which is the only thing the Commonwealth really cares about. They don't care about the underlying test. They care about extrapolating backward several hours. Mm -hmm. But that this sort of goes along the, the, the theme of garbage in, garbage out. If the underlying test was not valid or it can't be proven to be valid, then, of course, the extrapolation is also invalid. Uh, the question remaining is, was the testing done by gas chromatography? Was it enzymatic testing? We don't know and we'll never find out. We don't have reports to suggest that uh, or exactly what the validity of those tests were. So the initial result is suspect and by extension, the extrapolation is also suspect. It, it bears pointing out, Your Honor, and this is the only sort of granular detail I want to get into, the extrapolation, according to the Commonwealth's expert, is somewhere between 0.13 and 0.29. I have been screaming this into a closet since I first saw this report. 0.13 and 0.29. That was the closest range they could get it down to. That is um, almost double the legal limit to more than triple the legal limit. Really? Best you could do? How unreliable is that? calculation or person who did that extrapolation or the initial the, the whole thing is it strains credulity and we are outraged blood alcohol concentration that is a swing of more than 123 percent in other words the swing of the extrapolation is larger than any one of the numbers themselves which means uh it can't be, it, it simply cannot be reliable. It illustrates the invalidity of the underlying serum plasma test. And for those reasons, the defense objects to the admission of both the blood test, the underlying test, as well as the concomitant extrapolation. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Come on. Here she's like, okay. She's just blowing, blowing by the fact that they have on dash cam footage, Sergeant Good doing something not so good. Saying at 6.30 on his day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to section her. Somebody asked about the blood draw. The blood wasn't drawn until I believe after 9 a.m. Angela says, did they want to section her just so they could get this blood alcohol level? Well, 
they would have to, they could, they could have sent their troopers down there to get a blood draw. So I don't know. Did they want to get her away from the car? I mean, there's, a, I don't know. This is going to be left up to the jury to decide why they did it. You can tell me what you guys think to keep her from going back to the house. I don't know. Your Honor, so what the Commonwealth would submit is this may have been a valid ba basis for a motion to suppress, but it was a motion to, to suppress that was never filed and one that the defendant specifically waived, uh, that Mr. Yedetti waived mm. all uh, motions to suppress. As it pertains to... Uh <laughs> yeah, no, that's not how it works, dude. This is a motion in limine to exclude. It's called strategy, my friend. It's called strategy. Uh, Mr. Roberts from the Office of Alcohol Testing's testimony regarding the serum conversion and the retrograde extrapolation. The reason for the range is because it's math and essentially <laughs> taking into account a number of uh, different variables. Oh my variables. God, wait a second. Uh, the reason the for the range is because it's math. Wait, the, I'm sorry. I started laughing before I put it on pause. The reason for the range is because it's math. Olivia, are you still here? Anybody in law enforcement, anybody who does any sort of blood testing for alcohol levels, the reason for this swing is because it's math. I mean, what is he going to say next? It's girl math. Sorry, it was, you know, it was a girl who did it. It's girl math, Your Honor. It's girl math. Wow. Just can't make it up. You just can't. I mean, I have secondhand embarrassment for this argument. I have said, <laughs> Team Brittany, math ain't math. And it's new math. Math ain't math. And I, 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 what? Yeah, he's a prosecutor. Has he never tried any case with drunk driving in it? He knows. He knows. He knows this is a ridiculous argument. I have secondhand embarrassment. Magnolia Gypsy, they claim she hit him at 1225 the night before and intoxicated when it happened. He, the blood is drawn for other purposes after 9 a.m., almost nine hours later. Right. First of all, they have no idea what she did when she went home. She could have went home and started doing shots because she was mad at him, and then she just passed out. So this shouldn't come in no matter what because it is drawn so far after it she allegedly hit him with her car that it should be excluded on. Then it should be excluded because of the methods used. Nobody even knows what the methods are because MSP didn't even come and do the blood draw themselves. And again, nobody knows what she did when she went home. So yeah, it, the math is methed up. Yep. Wow. That's right, Amy in Boston. She could have been pissed at John when she got home and kept drinking. She could have. is as it is as it pertains to the um the specific item that would be introduced in the evidence meaning the defendant's medical records that's what the commonwealth is referring to as the records uh, coming in mr roberts would come in and testify as to his own uh, analysis his mathematical calculations and the results based on his training and experience which the defendant has had for over two years, as Mr. Roberts testified at the grand jury to that exact uh, set of scenarios. As it pertains to the testing itself, the Commonwealth, uh, as indicated on its proposed final pretrial memorandum, has summoned in not only uh, the doctor who ordered the testing, the registered nurse, uh, the nurse practitioner, uh, who would both have been involved in the uh, taking of the sample from the defendant pursuant to uh, her medical treatment and medical diagnoses as well as the director of the lab uh, at Good Samaritan Medical Center, who would testify as to uh, what kind of testing is done and the nature of that testing and everything else. As it pertains to those witnesses, if the defendant wishes to conduct some sort of voir dire prior to the testimony in front of the jury, I certainly have no objection to that. Uh, but any sort of voir dire of Mr. Roberts or exclusion of his testimony uh, would be inappropriate based on the fact that uh, the defendant has had more than ample notice uh, as to what the parameters of that testimony would be. Uh, uh, so as far as what would be coming in as an exhibit, uh, it would be the medical records with that uh, amount in it. And then it would be testimony from essentially anyone and everyone involved uh, in the ordering, taking and analyzing uh, of that particular sample, which then provides the basis for Mr. Roberts' testimony.
Okay. So I have like one small paragraph from the Commonwealth on this. I want a memo on this. Sure. <laughs> All right. So I'll take this under advisement. And 17. And there 17. Yeah. Um, there 17. We still need to address some of. <clears throat> okay. Now, now she knows what their 17 is. Now she's back to the other, uh, the other numbers. But when he said like 289, she's like, well, that's not, I thought that's not how I have it. Or he said, uh, Alan Jackson, whatever. She's like, oh no, it's two, 289. That's how we have it. But now she remembers that this one is number 17. See the, this, the mind games here. Uh, is it gaslighting? Is it me? Am I, am I overreacting? Cause this is making me really mad. <laughs> really under advisement canoni. Um, now, now, now she needs a memo. So when is the memo due? When are they going to start ruling on these uh, the blood alcohol? Con because if that isn't coming in, the whole strategy of the case changes now. Because now it's no longer a drunk driving charge. Um, this is going to uh, insane. Did they? Did they rule on this later? I don't know. She said she wanted a memo. I don't think he could have ha given her a memo by the end of the day. Yeah, somebody said, if this is just pregame, we are in for a treat. Hi, Melissa. If this is just the pregame, we are in for a treat. Maureen, she's making you crazy. She's making me crazy. All right. So that's all of the defendants' motions and limine, correct, Ms. Giannetti? Let me just have a moment. <laughs> Mr. Jackson, it's all of them, isn't it? We, we, no, we're, no we, we filed a motion for attorney-conducted panel voir dire. Yeah, that's a joint motion, and that's what I already said we're going to talk about impanelment this afternoon. Just being complete in answer to the court's question. That was okay. one that was not addressed, but that's fine. All right. Oh, the, the request just to have panel. Your motion was a little bit confusing. Right. So you just, you want panel voir dire? Panel voir dire, correct. I, I'm not going to do panel voir dire in this case. So we'll talk about the particulars of it um, later this afternoon. All right. So on the Commonwealth's list of motions, you said that there are some that you may agree with. What besides the view? Are there any of these numbers? Who's? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the defense does not object to the Commonwealth's motions in limine numbers one through six. Um, number right, eight. One through six. Yes, number eight. Number nine. Number 11, we obviously joined in that request. Yes. Um, let's see. Number 14, we do not object to. Number 15, we have no objection in principle, but we, we do reserve the right to object to just individual exhibits as they, they come. Yeah. Uh, number 18, we have no objection. Number 19, we have no objection. Number 23, no objection. Number 26, no objection. I, I believe that's the, that's the one we addressed, that. yeah. Now she's got all that. She knows all the numbers now. Now there's no problem. Number 26, number three, she's got it all. It was because of uh, Lally's handy list. Is that what she called it? A handy list? Helpful list? And number 32, we have no objection. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Lally, I will hear you on our paper 297, your number seven. So, Your Honor, this is the Commonwealth's motion to preclude reference and redact the manner of death contained on the victim's death certificate. Uh, this is a, a routine motion uh, the Commonwealth files in, in really respect to any case. Uh, manner of death. That's is, not persuasive, so go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I'm just, manner of death uh, as, as, uh, elucidated in the motion is not something um, that is typically something uh, that is permissible to be testified to uh, from anybody to. I mean, if you guys are just joining, this is some of the finest word salad that you will ever hear. This is like the Peter Luger's chopped salad of tossed salads here. This is the word salad from Peter Luger's. If you know, you know. Um, I'm going to take it back a little just so you can enjoy it as much as I do. 
was uh, elucidated in the motion is not something um, that is typically something uh, that is permissible to be testified to uh, from anybody to the jury because that's sort of the question of, of liability uh, ultimately that is left to their uh, discretion um, as far as how they find the facts. But cause of death obviously is something that is a medical determination. Manner of death, as the court is well aware, is uh, there are essentially three or four different uh, selections and they fall into different. No, there are five. There are five. Let me explain it to you, Lally. There are five. Homicide, suicide, accidental, natural, or undetermined. The death certificate in this case says undetermined. The Commonwealth wants to preclude the jury from knowing that the death certificate for Officer John O'Keefe says that his death is undetermined. different categories they don't necessarily mean in the medical context uh, what they might mean in the legal context uh, so for that just sort of simple differentiation of, of meaning between the two uh, manner of death is not something that the Commonwealth feels is appropriate for the court uh, for any witness to be uh, testifying to uh, as far as the jury is concerned as that's a question uh, for them ultimately to determine and for those reasons the Commonwealth would ask that this motion be allowed all right, who's responding to this? Thank you, Your Honor. The medical examiner who completed the death certificate in this case concluded that the manner of death was undetermined. The Commonwealth now seeks to have that portion of the death certificate redacted because it is quite clearly exculpatory. All of the cases cited by the Commonwealth deal with the issue of whether it was error for the Commonwealth to admit a death certificate listing the manner of death as a homicide because it violates a defendant's right to due process and a fair trial under the 5th, 16th, and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitutions. Oh, this was my argument when we, when we went over these motions originally. This was my argument. I said all the case law said that you can redact if it's homicide or accidental, but it didn't address whether it was undetermined. So good. I'm glad that, that I was right. <laughs> None of the cases cited by the Commonwealth stand for the proposition that a medical examiner's determination that the manner of death is undetermined should be redacted. In fact, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Ellis at 373 Mass 1, it's a 1977 case, for the proposition that excluding the word undetermined is the better and safer course. But that's in the statement of the law, and I would urge the court to read the Supreme Judicial Court's opinion in that case. What it actually says is this, quote, nothing contained in the record of a death which has reference to the question of liability for causing death shall be admissible in evidence. The better and safer course is to exclude from a death certificate the words homicide, suicide, or accident in a criminal trial. Notably missing from that list of words that the Supreme Judicial Court warned about is the word undetermined. That is what the Commonwealth seeks to have redacted here. The Commonwealth bears the burden of proof in this case. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a homicide occurred, and their own medical examiner has opined that she was unable to make that determination. That finding is relevant, it's exculpatory, and there's no authority that supports its redaction. Thank you. All right, Ms. Delally, the medical examiner will be on your witness list, right? I haven't seen either of yours witness list. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so I'll take this under advisement. Again, under advisement. All right, Mr. Lally, your number 10, our number 300. Yes, Your Honor. In this motion, the Commonwealth is uh, simply seeking to uh, obtain Corey information or records of potential jurors, I'm not looking for uh, information pertaining to uh, jurors that as they come in or some voluminous amount uh, of every possible potential juror, but only seated jurors. <laughs> this, if you don't know what uh, Corey records are, is they want to run the criminal record of everybody <laughs> who's selected to, to uh, serve on a jury. So first know that you are not permitted to serve on a jury if you're a convicted felon in most states. I'm going to assume that's Massachusetts as well, but now they want to pry into the 
jurors' criminal records, see if any of they have any traffic infractions or misdemeanors or uh, anything like that. If they've had any run-ins with the law, because anybody who's had any run-ins with the law in Norfolk County might know they might have been through something as such like this similarly. Think that's why? Hmm. I don't know. Just guessing. Um, and essentially what the Commonwealth is requesting uh, is to uh, simply have some sort of verification that the answers that are provided by the jurors are uh, true and accurate. Um, this is something that is permitted by the case law, it's permitted by the statute, uh, and it's obviously something that the Commonwealth would share with the defense as required to, um, but the timing of it, of, of what I'm asking for, and the limited scope uh, that I'm asking for in relation to uh, just seated jurors once we have a full sort of uh, set of jurors, whether that be 12, 16, whatever the, whatever the court uh, chooses as far as the number, I'm, I'm assuming approximately 16 or so. Um, but once those are seated, the Commonwealth is just asking for some time to uh, to run those quarries and provide those uh, to counsel and then make any further objections uh, for cause prior to the jury being sworn. Okay. So I, I know you're not in agreement. Are you opposing this? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, we object for several reasons. Uh, first, uh, the jurors are given a questionnaire which specifically asks this question. Um, they self-report. We rely on self-reporting from jurors with regard to all questions. The Commonwealth has cherry-picked this one question to verify whether or not they're telling the truth without dealing with any of the other questions that the jurors are asked. Um, this proceeding right now, like many of these proceedings, is being broadcast widely, publicly. There are potential jurors out now uh, listening to this, mm -hmm. I'm sure, uh, waiting for an answer from the court as to whether or not they will undergo that further invasion of privacy. Uh, and they are also, I would submit, aware that in this unusual case, the Commonwealth, uh, through their special prosecutor, has sought to charge uh, picketers, protesters, in a very unusual uh, manner, uh, mm -hmm. we would claim a, a harassing manner. Uh, and our position is that this is just another method of harassment. We believe it's unfair. We ask the court to deny this motion. Do you have any case law to support your argument, Mr. Unetti? Uh, Your Honor, I... The, 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 Case law is, is simply the constitutional rights to uh, privacy that the jurors have. I mean, uh, yeah. this is, it's an issue of, of uh, fairness, Judge. So that's what we're relying on. All right. So the motion is allowed, Mr. Clerk, number 300. Thank you. Okay, well, she can rule on the bench of that one. She can now let everyone know who's being called in for jury duty that if they are selected to serve on this ju uh, jury, their criminal records will and will be shared with the other side and everyone will know. Maybe they won't be allowed to serve on the jury. Um, so Ariel, why would he want it once all the jurors are seated? Because it would be too burdensome to run it for every single person who is coming in just to be questioned. So I think that once they're seated, they'll run it and then they'll maybe he'll have some objections and say, well, you know, we'll have to question it. We'll have to question uh, them about it and see if they can be fair and if they can't or if they lied on their questionnaire. That's what he wants to know. He wants to know if they lie on their questionnaire. So in the, the questionnaire will say, have you been convicted of a crime? Have you ever had any run-ins with, you know, it'll, it'll ask specific questions. And he's doing this to see, or he wants to do this, and she's allowing it now to see if the jurors are lying. So uh, that's great. Um, it doesn't matter. Yeah, the jurors, they're afraid that the jurors are going to lie to them. And that's why they want to do this. Uh, I... I I think this is a really good time to take a little break to hear a word from our sponsor. Uh, and if you haven't heard, AT&T wireless customers, um, you may be affected by a massive data breach in which AT&T has released 74 million of their customers' information, including social security numbers, dates of birth, and names to the dark web, including current customers and anyone who may have been a customer before the year of 2019. So let's hear a word from our sponsor of today's show, Aura, while I take a short break. Did you know that the odds of falling victim to online crime are one in four? Online crime is soaring. It's time to get smart about online safety. 
That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura provides everything you need to protect your privacy, identity, finances, and your family in one easy to use app. Do you even realize how much of your personal information is already out there being sold by data brokers to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may wanna target you? Well, if you Google yourself, you may find something like this. And it may shock you to know that your full name, home address, email address, health records, and even relatives, it's all out there. That's one of the reasons you need Aura. Aura shows you which data brokers are selling your information and automatically submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Not only does cleaning up this information reduce the amount of spam that you get, but it will protect you from hackers who could use the information to help them access your social media accounts, bank accounts, and other sensitive information. Aura also helps protect me and my family from online threats by providing antivirus and malware protection, a secure VPN with military-grade encryption, credit monitoring, spam call protection, parental controls, password management, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It's really easy to set up. And best of all, I get everything at one affordable price. With the family plan, Aura will help you protect your kids by blocking harmful content, managing how much time they can spend online, and providing you with peace of mind while they game with cyberbullying and online predator threat alerts. I value my privacy and my online safety, and I value yours too. So go to Aura.com slash Melanie Little to start your two-week free trial because you can't put a price on peace of mind. I've also put the link in the video description below. You can thank me later. You can thank me later. And starting at only $12 a month for a VPN and everything else, I mean, I was paying individually more for all that stuff. So um, can't put a price on your privacy, my friends. I think you might agree. Free two week trial. The link is below the video. Check it out. I highly recommend. Patronus Glow, who's one of my mods, said that she uses Aura as well. So um, let's get back to this because this is um, that's the one she'll rule on from the bench. Allowing the jurors' criminal records to be run after they are seated. In other words, everyone who's watching this now does not want to, maybe, maybe does not now want to even serve on this jury or come in for jury duty. All right, Mr. Lally, you're coming into number 12 with me quite skeptical. Number 12 leading questions for 13 and 16 year olds. And again, Your Honor, um, let me just first start by saying I don't think that this is something that's going to be absolutely necessary, um, given what I know of, of the two uh, child witnesses in this case. Um, only filing under abundance of caution, um, more so should um, the need arise based on less so the age of the child, but the age of the child taken in conjunction or in the context of sort of the atmosphere of testifying specifically in this case, in this courtroom, um, with different things uh, going on as far as the amount of people and things of that nature. Um, so I, again, I don't foresee this being an issue, uh, but just an issue that I wanted to flag for the court, uh, should it become an issue uh, and seek sort of the court's ruling or permission in regard to it uh, prior to any sort of incident arising. Okay, given that caveat, is there any objection? No objection at this point, Your Honor. We can address it as it arises. Okay. Mr. Lally, keep in mind the jurors would much rather hear from the witnesses than from the Commonwealth. Of course. All right. Mr. Clerk, on, on that, we're just going to withhold. Okay. So they'll just decide on that as it goes, the leading questions of the kids. Hold ruling. Withhold ruling until a later time. Um, Commonwealth, you'll raise this again if need be. Yes, sir. All right. Jennifer says about the Corey um, search, she says, I think they're doing that because people who have dealt with law enforcement may have more skepticism towards law enforcement and there's a lot of police officers involved, right? 
and they can question them about them during jury selection. They can ask them and they ask them questions like that on the questionnaire. But this is basically saying like, we think you're all lying. We don't believe what you wrote on the questionnaire. We don't trust you. And so we're going to verify what you had to say. I know it sends a chilling effect. You guys are right. But yeah, I think Jennifer, I think you're right. But I think there's other ways of doing it besides running everybody's criminal record. All right. So on your next motion, you are number 13. Um, <clears throat> I had it. I don't. I don't have it in order. Just give me a minute. So the, I'm curious. Do you happen to have? Oh, we don't have the screen up. Do you happen? I'd like to see exactly what it is that you intend to introduce. So this is your motion eliminate to admit evidence that the defendant was in custody for a period of time after her arrest. Okay, everyone who's been, their mind has been wandering. Let's pay attention. Pay attention to this because this is important. This is important. Jim, is it possible for you to print that for me? Um, 13. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll hear you on this, Mr. Lally. And remind me the date that this body cam footage was taken. So, Your Honor, this is in reference to uh, the defendant's arrest post indictment uh, by the grand jury in this case. So it was June 9th, 2022. So that's why I have not seen the video itself. Correct. And, and that's certainly something that the Commonwealth uh, can, can provide for the court. But uh, essentially, when she's arrested and uh, during the booking process at the Milton State Police Barracks, um, the troopers who uh, conducted that arrest, I uh, were wearing a uh, body worn camera um, pursuant to their, their BWC. One of the very few times in this case that the troopers are wearing body worn camera. Keep that in mind. No body worn cameras happened when they were interviewing any of the witnesses in this case. No body worn cameras were worn when they went to Dighton to Karen's parents' house to interview her and to tow the car away. But the officer who arrested her, Officer Pye, I think he says his name is, he had a body-worn camera on June 9th of 2022 after she was indicted by the grand jury and her charges were upgraded to murder. Policy uh, with the state police. Um, council has a copy of the policy. Council has a copy of the okay. video. And essentially... And that's the policy of the state police. Thanks, John Monaco, for pointing that out because that made me pay extra attention. So let's take that back a second or two. So keep this in mind. This is after she's indicted. Because you remember, she was arrested and charged February 1st, I believe. They kept her in jail overnight, right? February 2nd, she came in and she was charged with the manslaughter charges. She was bailed out. And she was let go. And that was in district court. Those are, I think, misdemeanor charges, right? And then they decide to convene a whole grand jury on this thing. The grand jury is over a couple of months, 14 days of testimony. They heard from something like 41 witnesses. They upgrade the charges to murder. So this is when they're going to pick her up on the murder charges, June 9th of 2022. And they want to show the body-worn camera video. And we're going to look at it. And tell me if you think that what he says it's going to show and what it actually shows is one and the same. Or again, if I'm tripping. Police. Um, I'm sorry, but the video itself. Correct. And, and that's certainly something that the Commonwealth uh, can, can provide for the court. But uh, essentially, when she's arrested and uh, during the booking process at the Milton State Police Barracks, um, the troopers who uh, conducted that arrest uh, were wearing a uh, body-worn camera. Um, 
pursuant to their their BWC policy uh, with the state police. Um, council has a copy of the policy, council has a copy of the video, and essentially there are a number of different statements which provide sort of um, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, I'm not sure what number we're up to at this point uh, of sort of varying accounts that the defendant has provided to Can numerous Can you give people. me an idea? Okay. He's saying that this is going to be her sixth varying account. Keep this, I'm, I'm, make, I'm taking notes. Sixth varying account of what? Yeah, now. Do you, do you know the substance? So the substance of these particular statements uh, is uh, the defendant, Ms. Reed, uh, continuously uh, is told by Sergeant Buchanan uh, to essentially stop talking. He's advised her of her Miranda and advised her to, to stop making statements uh, and repeatedly states that to her during the course of her making statements. Uh, but the sum and substance of it... Uh, okay, he repeatedly advises her to stop making statements... Repeatedly, that's Sergeant Buchan Buchanan. Guess I've been pronouncing it wrong all along. I've been calling him Buchanan. I guess it's Buchanan, or maybe he's pronouncing it wrong. I don't know. He advises her to stop talking several times. Uh, is she says something to the effect of, you know, are you in on the joke? Are you in on the joke? Uh, and then makes some sort of reference uh, to having witnessed Brian Albert and. Having witnessed. Colin Albert uh, essentially smash John O'Keefe's head into the taillight. Having witnessed Brian Albert and Kevin Albert smashing John... Wait, I'm going to take this back because this is important. Uh, but the sum and substance of it uh, is she says something to the effect of, you know, are you in on the joke? Uh, and then makes some sort of reference uh, to having witnessed Brian Albert and Colin Albert uh, essentially smash John O'Keefe's head into the taillight. Okay. Having witnessed Brian Albert and Colin Albert smashing John O'Keefe's head into the taillight. He says that Karen says that she witnessed Brian Albert and Colin Albert smashing John O'Keefe's head into the taillight. And that she says, are you in on the joke? Indicating that that's how her taillight was broken. Indicating that that's how her taillight was broken. Because she saw Brian Albert and Colin Albert smash his head into the taillight. Um, doesn't make any sort of further statements about why she would then leave the scene after that occurred or anything like that. Uh, but these are, again, uh, different accounts uh, that have been made uh, in direct variance to prior statements that she made. January 29th uh, to the troopers, to paramedics, to treating medical professionals, to Ms. Roberts, to Ms. McCabe, to uh, the niece of Mr. O'Keefe, to a whole other sort of uh, slew and variety of, of people with a different sort of uh, variation on what transpired uh, each time. Uh, so it's sort of inextricably intertwined uh, with the fact that she's in custody. I, how, I, how so? Is she in handcuffs? Is she in a she's cell? She's seated at the, uh, the booking desk or the booking rail in the state police barracks. Uh, so, I, I mean, I don't need to make direct reference to it. I, it's just, again, it's something out of abundance. Oh, no, we want to see it because now we want to see it because now we want to see that what this video shows is exactly what you told us it was going to show, that she says that she saw Brian Albert and Colin Albert smash John O'Keefe's head into her taillight, and that's how it became broke. That's how it broke. It's a caution based on sort of where it is and when it is that the statements are made, uh, that it may naturally sort of come out as far as it, if the court wishes. I, I think it's something that the court can can cure uh, by issuing a curative instruction uh, if there's any prejudice to be suffered by the defendant. Uh, but again, um, it is a statement by the defendant, which is admissible as the court is well aware. Uh, and then uh, it is sort of in the confines or in the context of her being in custody when she makes that statement. I certainly wouldn't be trying to elicit testimony that she was in custody, but it, it's, it is kind of apparent that she is. Uh, well, can yeah. Can have that here for this afternoon? Uh, yes, I, I can arrange for that. So we can see it? Sure. All right, what's the defendant's position here? I would get up and say, I have no objection to this video. Now that I know what the video shows, I'd be like, I have no objection to this at all. But I don't know what he says, so I forgot. Let's see. We object.
Your Honor, uh, we're in a situation now where uh, the Commonwealth arrested Ms. Reed twice when they didn't have to. Uh, I made the argument to you at arraignment uh, back in June of 2022 that after John O'Keefe was found dead on the lawn of Brian Albert, uh, Al Brian Albert's home, um, I immediately got a letter out to the state police saying, I represent her, I will surrender her, no need to arrest her, just call me and I'll bring her in. They ignored that and they arrested her uh, to get her into custody. Um, I would assert ultimately to make the arguments that Mr. Lally's making today. Uh, then, uh, astonishingly to me, uh, after the grand jury issued indictments, based on basically no new evidence, uh, they uh, upcharged her and once again did not contact me, despite the fact that she was completely in compliance with the terms of her release and had made every court appearance. They arrested her again. Uh, and so again, I would assert to be in the position that there are, they are in today. Um, with regard to the case that they cited, Your Honor, uh, Hoffer does not stand for the proposition that they claim that it does. Uh, in fact, uh, the issue of uh, that defendant being taken into custody was stricken by the court. Uh, the uh, testimony in that case uh, that was allowed uh, or sanctioned by the SJC was uh, evidence that uh, the defendant had been living uh, with his uh, girlfriend, but had unexplained absences. He didn't get along with her son. She was afraid of him and that he associated with a, a, conduct, a, a convict that made her uh, nervous. There was nothing about him being in custody that was admitted in that case. Um, to the extent that these statements are, or the court deems these statements to be relevant and admissible, um, there are other ways to do it. Uh, I do urge the court to watch the video. Yeah, I, I think we'll put it on the screen because I wanna see how the jury would look at it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but I will suggest, Your Honor, that there are other ways to accomplish that, uh, You know, either to uh, have testimony about what it was or failing that uh, to have the audio of my client making whatever statements they seek to introduce without the video. Uh, an image of my client uh, you know, in handcuffs at a police station is what this court uh, generally tries to avoid, given the fact that as she sits here and as this trial is ongoing, she's presumed to be innocent. We wouldn't bring her up here in, in an orange jumpsuit and then ask the jury to make decisions about her, nor should we uh, display her, uh, you know, after, the, after a, a perp walk at the police station in handcuffs uh, making these statements. All right, so I need the Commonwealth to, do you have um, your media person available, Ms. Gilman or Ms. Crawford or whomever? Yes. All right, we're we'll, seeking we'll, to make arrangements for that. All right, we'll put it on the screen just so I can see how the jury would see it. Okay, all right. we're gonna make arrangements for that too because we've got it. And I'm gonna pull it up right now because I don't even wanna wait because I want you to see this as close in time as you can to uh, having heard what Lally just told us that this video is going to show. So uh, here it is, um, buckle up and you may be outraged. This was in the afternoon session. All right, Jim, I need just a minute with the computer, please. Okay, thank you. Back on the record on the Karen Reed matter. Okay, so good afternoon, counsel. Good afternoon, Ms. Gilman. I appreciate you being here. Um, before we see this video, just briefly, I just want to say that there were 
really only two motions that I'm comfortable with deciding uh, by the two o'clock call here. Uh, Cornwall's motion in limine of intent to obtain Corey. I don't know if I already allowed that, but that's allowed. You did. And the uh, Cornwall's motion in limine, Jim, I think this is 317. Cornwall's motion in limine to prohibit reference to any federal investigations conducted by the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, or FBI. So that will come into evidence the way that it typically does here in Massachusetts. Spoiler alert. So we're going to hear the argument on that motion after we watch the video. You can question as to a date where the statement was made under oath, and we can discuss it um, as it gets closer in more detail. So the other motions are under advisement. We'll talk about that when we come back to sort of housekeeping matters uh, at the end of the day. So uh, do you have that video all pulled up, Mr. Lally, for me to see? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And Your Honor, for the record, uh, it's a little bit lengthy as far as the entirety of the video. The portion uh, that I would be submitting to the court is from uh, seven minutes and four seconds until nine minutes and 55 seconds. Okay. Can we? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to. Oh, I don't know if the closed captions. Uh, closed captions are unavailable for this, but. This is, they're in the precinct behind the bench. I mean, behind the, the counter. And she's like here to the left. Like you can't, we can't even see her in this video. I can't see her. This is his body cam and it's facing his computer screen. And you're just going to hear him talking and you'll hear her talking, but we can't see her at all. I had this vision in my head that we were going to see Karen and see her facial expressions. And that's why they think this is so damning as if she was going to say something like, be giving them because everything I see in these toxic chats on other channels are all about how Karen is smirking and she's got this, you know, grin on her face and she needs to, uh, you know, tighten up her game with regard to her facial expressions because she just looks snarky and everyone's going to find her guilty because of that. So hopefully you can hear this and make out what they're saying without captioning. Uh, let me know. Okay. Um, can you explain to me what the process is right now? Absolutely. So you're going to be uh, up just like last time. She said, can you explain to me what the process is right now? And he says, you're going to be booked just like last time. And so remember, they booked her originally like February 1st and she was arraigned February 2nd. And now this infuriates me as an attorney. This infuriates me if there are any fellow attorneys in the chat. Tell me if this infuriates you. Instead of calling her attorney because they know she's represented by Yanetti, instead of calling him and saying, hey, listen, we indicted her. The grand jury has indicted her. We've upped the charges. Can you bring her down and surrender her? Can you bring her in? They go and they arrest her and they cuff her and they bring her in the car and they bring her down there by herself. That is just unheard of and disgusting and gross in every way. Not even a professional um, courtesy to her. They know she's representing, they know who's representing her. He's been representing her this entire time. And they go and they bring her in. They don't even call him. And so she's still waiting. She hasn't even had a chance to make a phone call yet. And so you're gonna be booked just like last time, remember, like last time. Uh, go through the same process is going to be a little less uh, time-consuming. They're not going to do major case prints because we did those last time. Um, once you're... Can you hear this or do you want me to repeat it? He said, we're probably not going to do prints because we did that last time. Books and you go through this portion of it. We'll uh, let you make a phone call just like last time. We'll make a phone call. Uh, your parents will be able to bring you whatever other well, additional, additional needs, uh, things that you need. Yeah. And then um, 
and then tomorrow morning, um, you'll go and be arraigned at Norfolk Superior. You can call your parents and have them bring you anything you need. And then tomorrow morning, you'll be arraigned. So we're keeping you overnight, even though you've already paid bail and you're out on bail. And we're not, you know, you can, you can have your phone call and you can call your parents to tell them what you want them to bring. Really? Record on the charges that I'm sure you'll go over the charges again when you're doing the warrant. But I'm on bail, so how can I be yeah, spending the night here again? All right, so I'll explain that portion to you as long as it's not going to interfere with you when you're ready to go. Yeah, I'm just waiting for Rams to. Okay. So um, initially, your arrest was on probable cause out of uh, the district court. Okay. So the charges that you were arrested on initially were by the district court. Uh, I was still in the district. That's where the arraignment was. It was, it was uh, district uh, level charges. Um, today, grand jury indicted you on these charges, which is second degree murder, lethal uh, homicide, and um, leaving the scene of a death. Okay, so those are the charges the grand jury that you want. So now you're being charged and will be arraigned in Superior Court, so for County Superior Court in Delta. Okay. So bail doesn't apply anymore? Uh, typically, I, I'm not. So we, she said the bail doesn't apply anymore? So typically, once murder comes into play, people don't get bailed out. So it's not manslaughter anymore. Is that the difference? That's correct. It's a higher degree of taking a life. Okay, so those, that's the charges that you're being charged with now, and you were indicted by grand jury. Okay, you're aware he was beaten up by Brian and Colin Albert. She says, you're aware that he was beaten up by Brian and Colin Albert. We're all in on the same joke, right? We're all in on the same joke, right? Notice how they didn't respond to her? At all? There's a moment of silence there, and then she starts talking again. My tail end is cracked and jaw was pulverized. Okay, you you need. She said, "My tail light was cracked, and John's John was pulverized." I'm gonna take that back a second. Okay, so those that's the charges you're being charged with now. And you were indicted by grand jury. Okay, you're aware he was beaten up by Brian and Colin Albert. I mean, it, uh, we're all in on the same joke, right? My tail light was cracked and jaw was pulverized. Okay, you you need to uh, abide by the, the the rights that were afforded to you. Okay, so you can you can talk if you want. If you want to talk, tell us what happened, that's fine. We'll listen, but you were ready to do right, okay? And, and I'm sure he's going to do it again. Didn't Lally just say, you're going to hear Buchanan tell her to stop talking several times? He's going to advise her to stop talking? Is that what he just said? He said, you can keep going if you want, but, you know, we read you your rights. Wow. All right, if you want to talk to us, you want to give us, give us um, uh, a story? Definitely. But we'll, we'll take no, it. I don't. I mean, I know you already know the story, so I don't need to. All right. Um, how long is the entire tape? So that is uh, Trooper Pai, uh, who was the arresting officer um, from the barracks. So it goes, I believe, uh, at least 90 minutes or so. 90 minutes. All right. Do you have the entire, we're not playing it now, but do you have the entire video? All right. I would like it marked for identification. Sure. I'd also like a copy of it so I can view the whole entire thing, put it all in context. I never like to see just sections. Sure. Uh, Funny that she uses the word section there, isn't it? I am outraged. I'm outraged. I am outraged. We can just take this down for a second. She wants to see the whole entire 90-minute video. That's the only portion that he wants to play during the trial. And he told you, and he told me, and he told the judge, and he told everyone in that courtroom that that video was going to show that Karen said that she saw Brian Albert and Colin Albert smash John's head into the taillight. And that's how it broke. 
Did anybody hear that? She did say we're all in on the joke, I guess, right? She did say that. And that begs another question that so many people are saying. I don't know if it's trolls. I don't know if this has been reported. I don't know if it's been said in open court. That there's been no mention of this third-party culprit defense until Alan Jackson got involved in this case. That's when the third-party culprit defense started. Oh, no, my friends. This was on June 9th of 2022. Alan Jackson didn't come into this case until September. And Karen is already saying that you know that Brian Albert and Colin Albert beat him up, right? Um, so I, I, I got to go to the chat for, for some, some minutes here. I, I got to. I'm, 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 I'm outraged. I'm outraged. Boston JD, thanks so much for your $5 super chat. There's a man on the ground, not a police officer. Hmm, yeah. There's a man passed out in the snow at 32 Fairview. 32. Instead of 34, it's 34. That is Jemmy Cabe's brother and sister's house. <laughs> 34 Fairview. That's where he was found. Uh, Matt Bond, thank you so much for tuning in from Australia with your uh, super chat. Hello, my spiffy legal mumbo jumbo talkie, Karen Reed, exclusive source. If it ain't from you, I don't trust it. Thanks, Matt. It's good to see you. It's been a while since the Maya trial. Shari, thanks for being a member for three months. Wow, almost 35,000 subs. True testament of your channel. Thank you guys for watching. Sandy B, thanks for your super chat. Brandy's face during the trial, priceless. During this hearing, you mean? I didn't see, I didn't see it. I was kind of listening to it. Uh, Donna, thanks for being a member for three months. Lori, thanks for being coming a member. Thanks on top for your super sticker. Appreciate you all. Intolerant. Thanks for becoming a member. You're really going to like it here, I think. Suzanne, thanks for the 10 spot. She is highly unprofessional for a judge. I cannot believe how biased she is. Uh, you know, I try and give every judge a fair shake and I'm just, this is outraging me. I'm being, I'm outraged. Tiffany, thanks for your 10 spot. Uh, the CW keeps digging their grave. Deeper and deeper. This was just a sliver of the embarrassment they're about to endure. Love your channel. Oh, thanks. This was earlier in the stream. So thank you for that. Matt, coming in again with the super chat. Baby shark. <laughs> oh, that's back. All the way back when we started talking about Lally's uh, bathtub hair from when my kids were little. Nelly said, trial hasn't started, but I'm calling it. This judge's rulings and instructions will cause the jury to vote guilty, and then it will be appealed and overturned. Then a new trial and a new judge will throw it out. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I just don't see a conviction here. I just don't see it. There is so much reasonable doubt, even if some of the stuff is included. So much reasonable doubt. So much. We've been through it a hundred times, but we can go through it again. Uh, CBC, thank you for your super chat. This Florida court reporter has been told, if asked if I need a break, the only answer is yes. Oh, really? That's interesting. Because that judge, mean, it means the judge wants to break a break. And the judge wants you to take the fall for wanting the break. Got it. I, I see what you're doing there. We're going to see that coming up. We haven't gotten to that part yet. Uh, Pamela the Camel, in Massachusetts Rule of Evidence, Section 1105, third-party cul third culprit evidence. Judge must make a finding regarding relevance, not too remote or too speculative. It will not confuse or prejudice the journey, jury. Thank you very much. There is a case law that has some additional parameters uh, with regard to that. And there is a difference. Remember, we went over this last time between a Bowdoin defense and a third-party culprit defense. And they are both on the table at this point. Thanks, Carrie, for your super sticker. Uh, Virginia, thanks for your super chat. His hair is like something like Mary hairdo. Matt, uh, Luke, I am your father. Wait, I'm judging. Oh, that's very funny. Thanks, Matt. Shaquille Oatmeal. Yes, the Commonwealth uh, is not just Massachusetts, also Virginia. Also, I believe Pennsylvania is a Commonwealth, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Lacey, did the feds investigation say it wasn't a human hair? I don't recall this moment. This is very, very, a lot of details here. And I'm not sure if the feds even got involved in the hair discussion. But I remember that originally they said it wasn't a human hair and then they weren't. And then they kept sending it off because they wanted somebody to say it was a human hair, obviously. When will the Commonwealth dismiss the case? Doesn't the thousands of pages of federal documents show a proffer agreement? We're going to get to that. Carrie, thank you so much. Your coverage is so refreshing. Thank you. Thank you so much for the five spot. Uh, Sherlock, Kendra, TC, Goth, thanks for becoming a member. And Amy, 
I'm an honorary Boston girl. Thank you, but I I can no longer root for the Bruins, you guys. That is over. Playoff season is coming. Playoff season is coming. Heavy Holler, thank you so much for your super chat. Should Bev have recused herself when she found it out when she found out the Alberts were involved? Uh, we went over that entire motion. Go back and watch that stream. It was a really good stream. We went over the motion. We went over all of the things and the stuff. And it would have been very easy for her to just walk away and be like, listen, I don't even want the appearance of impropriety here. I don't know these people, but people think I do know these people. And I want this to be a fair trial. And I'm going to walk away from this case because not only that, I'm also being transferred to civil court. So it would have been easy to walk away. She did not do that. Uh, but I think there were a lot of reasons uh, that she should have. <laughs> so go back and watch the stream and then let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you for the first time finding my live, Beth McNally, and for your super chat. And Sheila, thanks for becoming a member. And Scott, thank you for the super chat. So when the bizarre eventuality comes uh, to being, all the witnesses pleading the fifth, the witnesses can claim it's because of Big Bad Turtle Boy. Yeah, I think probably that's what they're saying, right? Jewel, thanks for the super sticker. And Jessica, thanks for the super sticker. And Tammy Truth, thanks for the super sticker. You guys are awesome. Bridget Norman says, good Sam doesn't even have a psych unit. So how are they going to section the, her there? That's a great point. I hope that comes up during cross. Thanks, a dog mom, for being a member for three months and for loving me. And I love all of you. And thank you for becoming a, a, a YouTube member. The font is too small. A white, I can't read it. I can't read it, but thank you so much. I'm putting, I'm putting it up there for everyone to see. And thank you, Charlene. Here, ten dollars. Here's for all the quarters I had to put in the swear jar during the stream. Thank you. Yes, Matt. Thanks again. A juror number one from Maya trial vibes much. Yeah. Although they're not singling the jurors out, they're going to do it to everybody. Stephanie, thanks for being a member for three months. None of this seems legal. Blows my mind. Yep. Bernie Heaven, thank you so much for your super chat. Thank you ever for all of your hard work and integrity. A straight up and down person. Lally's lies have gone global. Adore you from, I can't see, I think it's the UK. I think that's the flag. Suzanne, thank you for gifting five memberships. Ariel, thank you for your super chat. Third party culprits did it, Karen said. We want to exclude third party culprits, responds the Commonwealth. Yep, they do. Yes, 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 they do. Uh, guys, you know, you can't make this up. So I thought that that video was actually going to show what Lally said that it showed. But if this is, I mean, I'm the defense. I'm like, go ahead, show it. It just shows that we knew that other people were involved in this within three months. No, June. Four months. And probably even sooner than that. She did have to pay even more bail this time. I think they upped it to something like 100 grand. And then I think it got reduced to 80. I don't even know what it's up to now, but they even argued to try and get some of that back. She's not a risk. She's not a flight risk. She's not a risk to the community. And she needed the money for her defense. I don't ever know what happened with that bail argument. Maybe somebody wants to help me with that. I'm going to go through all the rest of these questions while we go back to the morning stream because we're still on the morning. And that's where we are. We broke to watch the video. Thank you. So that's, we'll look at that this afternoon. All right, so I'll hear you on the celebrate motion, uh, your motion number 16, Mr. Lally. Thank you, Your Honor. So in this motion, what the Commonwealth is requesting uh, is uh, for permission uh, for the uh, celebrate expert, Mr. Whiffen, uh, to uh, conduct a demonstration in the courtroom during the course of his testimony in regard to uh, the um, examination that he did in regard to Ms. McCabe's extraction report and specifically uh, the uh, alleged search, uh, which the defendant purports uh, occurred at 2.27 in the morning and the Commonwealth maintains occurred at 6.23 and 6.24. I want to stop you because one question is how long will this take if we allow it? How long will the demonstration take? So um, really what I'm seeking to do ideally uh, would be for sort of a live demonstration, uh, which I had... Uh, Really, we need to do like a PowerPoint presentation on the Celebrite because it was so horrifically done that you need to explain why it was horrifically done by giving the jury a PowerPoint presentation to watch. 
uh, Officer Whiffin or Mr. Whiffin's um, Celebrite extraction. Come on. The 227 search happened, okay? We know that now. We know that now. Stop denying it. And stop trying to prove it with your crappy technology that you say didn't exist at the time. So how could we have found it? Because we now know, because the feds found it, that it actually really did happen. So come on, just, just walk away from that. Uh, Mr. Whiffin, do and record and provided a copy of, of that to uh, to council as well. Uh, so that recording that I that I provided uh, has no audio to it, but there was also a uh, PowerPoint presentation that Mr. Whiffin prepared in relation to uh, the same issue uh, that he uh, produced, and then I provided that to uh, to council as well, which essentially goes through what he did. Um, and it also you're not looking to do a PowerPoint presentation. No, are you? no, no. The PowerPoint presentation would not be something I'd be looking to admit. The reason I did the video is in the event that technology is not our friend on that particular day and, and the live demonstration doesn't work, uh, I would then be seeking to uh, introduce the video and have him talk about it uh, while it's playing. Um, really? In case technology is not our friend that day, I'm going to have him pre-record a video just in case we don't know how to work it so that we know exactly? Come on now. It mirrors... Uh, essentially or exactly uh, what Mr. Whiffen had uh, included in his report, uh, which was done back in uh, almost a year ago at this point and has been provided to council uh, and is essentially the same thing uh, as what's contained in his report, but just uh, as far as a, a visual uh, aid and demonstration uh, for the jury. Um, I just think it's a bit with when particularly talking about sort of the technical aspects uh, of his particular analysis. Uh, the Commonwealth uh, would submit that it would be uh, helpful and assistive uh, to the jury in order for them to have that sort of visual uh, demonstration to go along with, uh, obviously, the oral testimony of, of the witness as well. All right. Who's arguing this for the defendant? Thank you, Your Honor. We received from the Commonwealth the video that Mr. Lally just described um, about 48 hours ago. So we have not had an opportunity. 48 hours ago. 48 hours ago. Oh, it's just a little bit more in the same vein of all the evidence turnover that they've been doing for over two years, which is slim and none. And slim just got on the bus to confer with our expert about that particular issue. Okay. Um, however, just from sort of a cursory review, it does appear that its submission is improper. Um, as the Commonwealth acknowledges in its motion, in order for the court to allow a courtroom experiment or reenactment, there are very strict rules concerning that experiment. It has to replicate with exactitude the actual event so that it is fair and informative for the jury. Otherwise, it's prejudicial and would serve only to confuse the jurors. Here, just based on a cursory review, it does not appear that Mr. Whiffen's in-court experiment replicates all of the factors that we know were in existence at the time in question. Does it, does it replicate the factors that he says he considered? So I'll, I'll need to have a little additional time if the court doesn't mind to yeah, confer so, with so, my expert. Yeah, so I will give you time to confer with your expert. He, he, he hands this over to them 48 hours before this is to be argued, and he expects them to be able to oppose it. A little bit of a trial by ambush, wouldn't you say? How long have we been arguing about this Celebrite extraction? How long? I don't know. Over two years? Wow. And file a written response. But that, that's one of the factors that I'm asking you to look into. Understood. And then just if the court does intend, after a written briefing, to consider admitting that evidence, we would ask to be able to take their expert on voir dire as to that particular issue. Okay. Thank you. All right, how much time, Ms. Little, do you think you'd need to confer with your expert and put something in writing? Um, I believe a, about a week should be sufficient, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I, I neglected to answer the court's question as far as timing. The video uh, demonstration, which is essentially what I'd be asking him to do, is about 19, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. All right. So Mr. Clerk, that's under advisement. So what remains on Commonwealth Motion 17? The you know, statement, so the... the, the, the Michelle, you're not the only one confused here. We are all confused. 
So I know this also what this went to the the blood draw, but there were statements. That's what separates this from the defense motion to exclude the testing. So I'll hear you on that. Sure. Is the defense objecting to that portion of the Commonwealth's motion? Thank you for for uh, that opportunity. Not particularly. No, it's the it's the blood draw and the extraction. Yeah. So the motion had both. So that's why. All right. So I guess we don't need to hear. So the the part of your motion that concerns the statements made by the defendant, the defense is not objecting to. No. The, uh, very obviously, they're admissions. I mean, everybody knows what the rules are dealing with admissions. <clears throat> so I'm not concerned about that. Okay. All right. So Jim, on 307, it's a split. Um, the Commonwealth is permitted to introduce statements made for purposes of medical treatment. And that's fine. Anything like an admission, if someone is going to say she said I hit him, I hit him, uh, that's coming in. I mean, that's under the, the hearsay exceptions. So that's one thing I agree with. And the certified medical records. But there's an objection as to what we've heard regarding the alcohol testing, the blood testing for alcohol. Okay. All right. You're number 20, Mr. Lally. Our number. 20 yarn, I believe, uh, refers back to the, the same argument that the Commonwealth had made in opposition to the defendant's motion to exclude anything about the nature of the relationship. Okay. Uh, things of that. That's why I don't have it right here. Okay. 21, the out of court statements regarding the victim's state of. Scott, just let me know how the chat uh, is moving and if you want me to slow it down anymore. It seems like it's moving really quickly. Thank you, Justin Green, for the cash app. And Maureen Francis, thank you for another. Cash up, and she says, thank you for taking so much time with us. I appreciate you very much. And Mary also sent a cash up and says, not much, but from the heart. That is very, very sweet. And it's not about the money for me. This is about um, truth and justice and the Constitution and innocent until proven guilty and all of those good things that we're supposed to believe. mind so 21 uh sort of pertains to that same issue as 20 uh so essentially it's it's the same argument you're on the same and breaking news scotty scheffler has won the masters tournament for the second time in three years to all my golfing buddies out there uh that just showed up in my breaking news and obviously i'm here with you so we maybe you're watching the masters on your tv and you're watching me on your laptop but uh that is breaking news right now so congratulations to Scotty Shuffler. And thank you, Emmy, for your Venmo. That was very sweet. Facts underlying it as far as statements uh, that the uh, victim, Mr. O'Keefe, made but, to. But were you making statements regarding like bins and, and those cases, Commonwealth versus bins, the, the state of mind of the defendant, the defendant, I mean, state of mind of the victim, the defendant knowing it, the defendant being able to act as a result specifically? Okay. So on that sort of specific application of, and that's that's why we filed two separate motions right. in relation to it. But as it applies to that, uh, the Commonwealth would submit it as clearly met its burden under the case law as it applies to that because of the nature of some of those communications. Uh, so it's not just communications that are observed uh, by other parties as far as what uh, the victim, Mr. O'Keefe, uh, indicated uh, to Ms. Reed, or these aren't situations like in some of the case law where it's an indication to a third party and the defendant wasn't present and then there's sort of an inference that can be made that well if they're saying it to this friend of theirs then they must have communicated that to the person with whom they're in the relationship with in this instance your honor we have direct communication between mr o'keefe and miss reed uh, via text communications from each of their phones uh, indicating that that communication about ending the relationship was made just prior to uh the date of his death in this particular case uh, so it not only uh, enhances but what I would submit is corroborates uh, that testimony from from other sources or from other family members and, and other witnesses. Uh, so for those reasons, the Commonwealth that would ask that this motion be allowed. I, 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 right. it, that was the word salad. I don't even know what he's asking to have admitted. Text messages between Karen and John? 
about their relationship? Your Honor, on this motion, our position is that uh, we'd like more specificity about which statements the Commonwealth is indicating they seek to admit. Um, I imagine that's that the same thing I said to you, Mr. Lally, on the other one that was right. uh, in connection with this. So right. the Commonwealth will do that? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and I think then at that point we can evaluate it, Your Honor. Certainly some of these statements are, are going to come in, uh, but we'd like the opportunity to be able to object if they uh, no, are not I, I, I agree, so it has to be clearer. So you know, as far as the your notice to the defense, you can even point to grand jury minutes or whatever, but I need to know the, the statements you intend to introduce. Understood, Your Honor. And, and what I can... I mean, you know, just throw a spaghetti at the wall and hope something sticks. I mean, did you think nobody was going to ask you to nail it down? To be specific? I mean, come on, man. Doing what I'm, I aim to do to sort of an um, ancillary thing is um, I'd like to, uh, if the court is amenable and counsel is amenable, to, to pre-mark as many exhibits as possible uh, just to make the situation easier for both sides uh, as far as referencing documents, photographs, videos, things of that nature. Um, so when it comes to, uh, I'm not seeking to introduce, uh, when it comes to any sort of the, the cell phone extractions, um, I'm certainly not opposed to uh, admitting the entire extraction a dump essentially from from anybody's individual phone uh, but what i'd like to do uh, as far as exhibits are concerned is to uh, print out or create sort of uh, extraction reports uh, from those cell phones as far as different communications between person a person b just to make it more simple for the jury to to digest it and more simple for i think everyone involved to understand sort of the, the exact communications that we uh, intend to talk about uh, so in that vein as well, uh, what I can do is, is provide uh, a supplemental memorandum in regard to 20 and 21, referencing sort of those specific conversations. Okay. This word salad is now like a tableside Caesar. It's like a tableside Caesar with anchovies instead of anchovy paste and like real ingredients and a raw egg and all of it. Like that was a fine word salad and I still have no idea what he wants. That'd be great. And if you can work together, and this will be part of the housekeeping we talk about this afternoon, um, work together to pre-mark exhibits. Work that together. Would be great. All right. So twenty-two. So again, with 20, with respect to 22, uh, and I think the same can probably be said uh, for 23 uh, and 24 and 25, uh, is that essentially, uh, as I've stated earlier, the Commonwealth is somewhat operating in the dark and that I don't have any discovery, I don't have a witness list, I don't have any investigator reports or notes or notice of an expert or notice of an, any sort of expert reports, curriculum vitae, really anything. Um, so out of an abundance of caution, Curriculum vitae? <laughs> it's a curriculum vitae, number one. It's a CV, also known as a resume. That is your a Latin lesson for today, my friends. Curriculum vitae is like a, like a resume of an expert witness, or CV for short. But like we said a hundred times, you haven't turned over everything. So mm, you filed your certificate of compliance, what, this morning? And now you expect everything handed to you? Mm. The Commonwealth filed a uh, motion to eliminate number is 22, which is in reference to any alleged bad character or any prior misconduct uh, of the victim or any witness uh, that the defendant alleges uh, to uh, seek to elicit through whatever witnesses uh, they may or may not have. Uh, but essentially what I would state in regard to this specific issue uh, is that as the court is well aware, it has to be uh, something that uh, is first of all relevant uh, to anything. And it also has to be relevant uh, to a reputation and not just an anecdotal uh, something that that's brought up from one witness again who I, I don't even know who those witnesses would be at this time so um, I don't know that the court can rule on it without any sort of notice uh, as to whether or not the defendant intends to seek to introduce such evidence or has any such evidence or who those witnesses would be or what their level of of knowledge would be but it's it's something that I at least wanted to uh, to flag uh, for the court in regard to um, if it comes up as we go along Who's responding? That was me, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Um, this will be very brief. Um, 
the Commonwealth, in their, at least in their moving papers, uh, Mr. Lally, uh, I, I think, has gently stepped back from the moving papers a little bit. The moving papers suggest that they seek to preclude the defense per from presenting any evidence to the jury that uh, one or more of their witnesses lied or gave false information in, in this case in any particular. They call this, they, they do this under the rubric of bad character, but that misunderstands or misapprehends what bad or what character evidence actually is. Character evidence or bad character evidence refers to using past behaviors or past traits of a person to prove a, a propensity to act in a certain way in the future. Um, conversely, proving that someone lied or gave false or misleading information regards to, in, in regards to a, a specific matter that's relevant and material to the case at hand, that's called impeachment. Mm -hmm. And that's allowed in every single courtroom <clears throat> across so the So impeachment's certainly allowed, but do you- And that's like, you know, trial law 101. Impeachment, you lied. Were you lying then or are you lying now? How come you told, how come you told uh, Sergeant Lank this? And then how come you called Sergeant Lank back an hour later and you wanted to add this? And how come when you uh, then gave your statement to Trooper Proctor, when he came to your house, you said this and added some more detail? And then how come when you testified in front of the state grand jury um, and you made a timeline with your friends so you could both be consistent in your testimony, why did your testimony change that? And then when you testified in front of the federal grand jury, so were you lying then or are you lying now? Did you tell the truth in the federal grand jury or did you tell the truth at the state grand jury or did you tell the truth at the scene with Sergeant Lank or, you know, the scene of 34 Fairview or at the scene of your living room when Proctor came to your house or maybe when you were with Proctor at his house, did you tell him the truth then? So were you lying then or are you lying now? That is allowed, by the way. You intend to put on witnesses regarding challenging character evidence. No, yeah. we're not intending to. That, that's exactly what I was going to summarize by saying the, the bad character focuses on general character traits, uh, whereas impeachment deals with people who right. lied or were and untruthful. We Mr. intend Lally, to do the latter. Hold on, Mr. Lally, you're not objecting to impeachment, prior inconsistent statements, things like that. No, of course so not. So you... you um, counsel, you mentioned that there is a distinction between character evidence right. and straight impeachment. Character evidence is not permissible because you're not going to introduce it, you said, right? We're not seeking to introduce it at this point. We wouldn't. I mean, obviously, the trial has to play out, and it's going to be several yeah. weeks. And by the way, Mr. Lally has mentioned over and over and over about how he has no reports and no statements, et cetera. He's got more than 7,000 reports and statements, both from his own investigation and from the federal investigation, that in, in no small part encapsulates a lot of what we intend to impeach with. However, as I stand here today, I can report to the court that we don't intend at this juncture to put on bad character evidence. We, we don't know what that might look like. All but right. if we did, obviously, I know the rules. I would give the Commonwealth due notice and, and the court notice before right. we went that direction. All right. So 312, Mr. Clerk, is allowed. If you need to readdress that, uh, defense counsel, um, you need to file a motion. Okay. Allowed. So 30, 312, Jim, is allowed. Oh, it's allowed for the Commonwealth. Uh, it's okay. If they can impeach him. It's all about impeachment. Intend to put on character evidence. This case is all about impeachment. It's not about calling people in to say that so and so is a jerk or an a hole or needed her own bathroom. So I thought she was. She just left a bad taste in my mouth. That's not what they're going to do. They're going to impeach them with their own words. It's, uh, it's a difficult standard or potentially problematic, but uh, do you intend to do it? Your Honor, we at this juncture do not have intend to put on character evidence, but we will give the court notice as well as Mr. Lally notice if we do change our mind. All right, so 313, Jim, is allowed and defendants can renew it. I'm sorry, what's the second part? Allowed? Defendants can renew it yeah. by written motion. It's a lot. It's a lot. 24. Is there an objection to that? I believe that was 24. Yes. No, that was no, 23. It was 23. Oh, 20, I apologize. 23, we had said we had no objection. Okay, I didn't And have 24 that. is the opinion or character. Okay, so 24 is, all right. I'm sorry. 20, 24 is allowed, Jim. 23 and 24 are allowed. All right. There's an objection to 25, Ms. Little. 
just yes, yes or no. Mr. All right, Jackson so is. so I'm going to hear from Mr. Lally on the motion. I just wanted to know if there was an objection. Your Honor, I could probably, if I don't, I don't mean to step on Mr. Lally's toes. If he wants to talk, he can talk. Uh, we don't anticipate asking any of our experts to read from a treatise. If that's what his concern is, and that's how I read the motion, we don't anticipate going there. That might short circuit this. So no treatise, no studies. They will refer to studies, they're not going to read from studies on the witness stand at this point, at this juncture. Certainly, their, their studies are the foundation of every expert's um, testimony. I mean, okay, but, but what he's saying is he, he has no discovery of even who your experts are, so how's he going to read all these articles? I understand, so. I understand that. As the court knows, and, and we anticipate, and I think Mr. Yanetti is going to address this with the court soon enough, he will be getting our expert reports. We now have, finally... Uh, their uh, their final notice of what their discovery is. Certificate uh, of compliance. And we are anticipating by the, the beginning of trial, by Tuesday, to have something in response to that. But no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna elicit uh, an expert to sit there and read from a study or read from a treatise, if that's what their concern is. Anything you wanted to add to this? It looks a little broader than that to me. It, it is a little bit broader than that, um, as far as it also refers to anecdotal experiences or, or things of that nature, which obviously wouldn't be contained within a study or wouldn't be contained within certain materials. Uh, so I, I'm sure counsel is well aware, and I'm, I'm not certainly saying that they're not, as, as far as what an expert can testify to and what an expert cannot testify to. Um, but essentially, what an expert can testify to is, is facts that they personally observe based on testing or things that they do uh, themselves. Um, facts uh, in regard. Anybody remember Charlie Brown? <clears throat> when the teacher would get up and talk with a wah, 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 wah. That's what I hear. That's what I hear every time he talks. Wah, wah, wah to uh, things that are in evidence or things that the council reasonably expects will be put into evidence. But the studies themselves, any sort of anecdotal uh, experiences that they may have had uh, or any sort of um, scientific literature uh, is not something that is permissible to be admitted as, as an exhibit. So if that is something that they seek to, uh, to talk about, uh, the Commonwealth would submit that that's improper. You know, what they did in this particular case, sort of what their baseline of experience is, what their baseline as far as their educational background in order to form some sort of opinion based on, on the facts as the, as the jury finds them uh, is certainly fine. But making any reference uh, to because it happened in this study, it must be true in this case is, is something that's simply not permitted. Okay. If I may... Candy, I was about to say this exact same thing. Candy Kane says, Lally will put the jurors to sleep, so I'm not worried. I know. I know. Briefly. Sure. Mr. Lally uses the phrase anecdotal experience. That's the first time I've ever heard that in, in this context. I don't know what he means by that. But if what he means by that is bringing into court something that the expert has done or experienced or has experience with and then relating that back to his opinion or his, her, her conclusion, isn't that what he's suggesting Mr. Whiffen do with his in-court experiment? That sounds like an anecdotal experience, but th that's just me. I think we have to take this on a case-by-case -case basis um, and, and, and figure out what the experts are going to say. I, I don't know what anecdotal experience means. I do. It means, um, so this one time at band camp, that's an anecdotal experience. So I can't really defend against that because... I've put hundreds, if not thousands, of experts on the stand. I don't know that I've ever asked, can you tell the jury what your anecdotal experience is with fill in the blank? So I'm not sure what he, and I'm not being glib, I just don't know what that means. Yes. So I, I don't know that the court can adequately rule on it. I think this may be something that we wait until the- So let's get the list of the experts. Take a look at the Commonwealth's discover. I mean, the uh, defendant's expert discovery to you, and you can raise it again. Thank you, Honor. Thank you, Honor. So, um, Jim, let's say no action taken. No action taken. <laughs> Sunflower, we got to keep laughing, or we're just gonna like be so right. we're gonna twenty-seven. Cry. We're I'll hear you, Mr. Angry. Lally. Yes, 
So, Your Honor, this motion eliminates in reference to uh, prohibiting uh, reference to any federal investigations conducted by the U.S. Attorney's Office or, and or the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Linus, Tommy. Lally reminds me of the character on Charlie Brown. The character is blind and just is there flying everywhere. I forget his name. Is that, is that Linus? Now you're testing me. Uh, so to this point, um, the U.S. Attorney's, Attorney's Office has uh, publicly confirmed that at no time uh, has the U.S. Attorney's Office named any person or entity uh, as a target. Uh, so any sort of reference uh, to uh, in, in essentially what they've uh, stated uh, throughout the course of, and I know the court has had a chance to review those materials, but what they state is essentially their investigation into some unnamed uh, uh criminal activity or some unnamed crime or some there, there's nothing specific uh, to any specific person or entity uh, that is contained within those materials so what the commonwealth is submitting is that any reference to the fact that those things occurred uh, is therefore uh, unfair you know essentially biases uh, against uh, one side or the other based on uh, based on that and it really has no relevancy as far as making <laughs> reference to uh you know, if, if counsel at some point either side wants to make reference to uh testimony or uh statements reports things of that nature that were provided uh in the course of of that discovery uh pursuant to the TUI, uh obviously that's perfectly permissible but it also can be done without making reference to where that item came from as far as you you know testify previously in relation to some investigation on such and such a date uh you know uh, you spoke to uh, a law enforcement agent on such and such a date and you said this um so it, if it's needed for those kinds of reasons as far as impeachment and whatever that's obviously perfectly permissible but any reference uh, to that in front of the jury uh your honor uh, is something that the commonwealth would submit uh is simply impermissible and irrelevant uh, to the facts uh, as they pertain to this case. Uh, so for those reasons, the Commonwealth would ask that this motion be allowed. Is there an objection to this? There is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, there is. Your Honor, the Commonwealth's position can be basically summed up in their moving papers with the following sentence that they drafted. The proceeding would be unfairly prejudiced if the, if the defendant is permitted to rely on the mere appearance or existence of a federal investigation, especially where the investigation was shaped and influenced by the defense. First of all, the defense... Okay, this is a master class in trial lawyering. So everybody, if you were watching the golf, it's over now. Give your full attention to this argument by Alan Jackson attorney at law, some bombs are about to be dropped, right? Isn't this the part where he's going to start dropping the bombs? Let's go. Does not and did not shape or influence any federal investigation. The federal government is more than capable, Your Honor, and I think the Commonwealth knows this, of making its own decisions and ab about its own investigations. Second, and just as importantly, the Commonwealth cites no authority whatsoever that stands for the proposition that the mere mention of a federal investigation prejudices state court proceedings in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And that's because there is no authority. That authority does not exist. But most importantly, and this is critical, it is going to be critical to give the trier of fact, this jury, the proper context in which every one of the statements or every bit of the evidence is presented and how it came to light. It's essential for how, the jury. How are you going to do that? How do you propose? You, is somebody from the U.S. Attorney's Office on your witness list to come in and talk about it? There are federal agents. No, 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 no. We, we don't anticipate presenting the fact that there's a federal investigation. That's isn't not, isn't that what this does? It, but again, what if a witness just naturally asks a answers a question that way and happens to mention the federal investigation? Then is that okay, Your Honor? Because it seems to be okay in the other thing that we discussed before, right? No. You mention it? No. What, explain, what this does, explain to me why that's not so. The, that's what I'm doing. Uh, as the, as not, the court, not yet you haven't, so please explain that. Uh, as the court uh, knows, uh, it's just... Uh, not yet you haven't. I'm going to take that back for effect. There's a federal investigation. That's isn't not, isn't that what this does? If no, you mention it, no. what, explain, what this does, explain to me why that's not so. 
The co that's what I'm doing. Uh, as the as not, the not yet, you haven't. So please explain that. As the court knows, it's essential that the jury is given the context in which every single statement, whatever the statement might be, is brought to light. Does that mean? Do we say in the prior trial that resulted in a mistrial, you said this? N no, but you would say when you were speaking with Officer Smith or Officer right. Jones from the Canton Police Department at the Canton Police Station in this particular context, did you say this? When you were, uh, when you were questioned by the Commonwealth's attorney in this proceeding, did you say this? When you were questioned by the United States attorney in this hearing, did you say that? That's what we do. Otherwise, it's perpetrating a fraud on the jury. The information that's gleaned during the federal investigation was revealed, Your Honor, importantly, by a neutral third party, a neutral body that's not connected in any way to this case. The Commonwealth has a stake in this case, very obviously. The defense certainly has a stake in this case, but the federal authorities have no stake in the case of the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Thus, the evidence procured by that neutral agency, which is independent of the case, is subject to a different and completely, a completely different level of scrutiny, a completely different level of assessment by the jurors. That is an important fact. There is no other way to truthfully and honestly present this evidence to the jury. Think, think about some of the questions that the court just posed. What were the circumstances in which you changed your testimony, sir? He's going to say, well, I changed my testimony, potentially, when I was called before a federal grand jury and I was asked questions under penalty of perjury. Why did you finally admit certain things when you were confronted with additional evidence, ma'am, and where did that evidence come from? Well, I was called before a grand jury and I was asked, or I was investigated, uh, I'm sorry, I was interviewed by a federal agent and I was asked or confronted with additional information, text messages, phone calls, etc. Or the third example, where did that additional evidence come from, officer? Text messages, uh, phone calls, private communications. Oh, it came from uh, a hearing in which I was questioned by a United States attorney under penalty of perjury in front of a grand jury. The jury's entitled to those answers in that context. If we were to do what Mr. Lally suggests, if we were to take that invitation, oh, well, you were asked by a prosecutor at a former hearing uh, X, Y, Z. That would leave the jurors with the imprimatur of the idea that the Commonwealth elicited those questions, that the Commonwealth did their job, when we know, in fact, it didn't. Ha! The we know, in fact, the Commonwealth didn't do its job. Uh-huh. Preach. Preach. Answers to those questions directly go to Ms. Reed's Bowdoin defense. Bowden talks about the inadequacy of an investigation. Obviously, Mr. Lally, I'm sorry, Mr. Gennetti can talk more about that in just a second. We have information that a different agency was able to uncover information that the state investigation ignored. Mm -hmm. That's important. And it's important for the jurors to be able to weigh and balance that information and how the information came to light. If the truth is actually hidden from the jury, which is what the Commonwealth is asking the court to do, that the evidence was produced by a, was the product of a third party. The truth being that the evidence was the product of a third party inquiry, unconnected to the state court case, then that jury is left with a false impression, false mm -hmm. information, and it'll be unable to, unable to properly assess the true facts, which is what we're trying to get to, the true facts. Why is the Commonwealth so intent on hiding the truth from this jury? Right. I'll submit. Right, okay. I'll likely rule on that today. Okay. So, or not. Number 28, Mr. Lally. Thank you, Aaron. So, again, similar to the, the motion previous to it, um, the Commonwealth is not seeking to hide anything from uh, the jury. Uh, what the Commonwealth is simply seeking to do is ensure that whatever information that's provided to the jury is actual admissible and relevant information and not uh, the, the product. Kind of like all the stuff that you submitted to the state grand jury to indict Karen, all that stuff that was not admissible, kind of like that. Rules for me, but not for thee. Rules, I mean, rules for thee, but not for me.
product of uh, rank speculation. So this motion uh, is seeking to prohibit reference to any pending internal affairs investigation or uh, unfounded allegations of misconduct. And really, primarily what we're talking about here uh, is any sort of uh, internal affairs investigation related to uh, Trooper Proctor and uh, the 20 something year old uh, uh, civil case, uh, which resulted in no findings of liability uh, that was referenced uh, by counsel. Okay, I don't curse on this channel, so I'm not going to say what I was just about to say. No findings of liability because they settled the case. The case settled because there was such a mountain of evidence against them that they settled the case and paid the plaintiffs. It was not dismissed. There was no finding of liability because there was no way in hell they could take that case to trial because the verdict in that trial would have been 10 times what the settlement was. Okay, so, um, hmm. In their motion to dismiss with reference to Sergeant Lank of the Canton Police Department. Uh, Lank. Under the case law, uh, including McFarland uh, and uh, Graham, the most recent case law, uh, what they essentially uh, attribute is that those uh, types of information, when there is no uh, finding of liability, there is no sustained finding of misconduct, there is no uh, uh, findings of liability uh, by uh, the party in question, uh, that that is simply not admissible. Uh, but you know what is admissible? All his deposition testimony that he gave in that case 20 years ago. Okay. And all the admissions that he made in that case. We're talking about Lank. If you know, you know. If you don't, go back and watch the last stream because we went over it at Lank. 20 years ago, there was a civil case where uh, Sergeant Lank pulled a friendly. The Alberts got in a bar fight. They arrested the other guys. Uh, they were They beat the crap out of them. Uh, and he arrested them and then they, the charges were dismissed and then they sued the county and they, and they won. They got a, a big settlement. The Lapalito brothers, right? Uh, so, you know, you can try all you want and cry all you want, but if, that, if he testified, that deposition testimony is out there for him to be impeached with. So, them's the rules. Uh, and so for those reasons, uh, McCall Mulf submits that this motion should also be allowed. All right. Who's arguing this for the defense? Oh, right. Sorry, Trump chick. That was Canton, right? Canton paid the paid that settlement. And Ms. Little, what I, I need to know is what exactly you intend to introduce and how you intend to introduce it. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I think it's it's somewhat premature for the court to, to rule on this issue. Obviously, the testimony of both of these witnesses is going to be highly relevant as to whether this particular information is relevant. Um, we are still actually receiving information with regards to the internal affairs investigation as recently as yesterday. Um, so I'm happy to like kind of defer ruling to the court and then address this as it comes up. I think the court will be in a much better position to rule on this issue once the witness testifies. All right. So what would be helpful to me once you know what it is you think you're going to try and introduce um, to tell me how that complies with the holdings in both McFarland and Graham? There are independent reasons why that is admissible outside of McFarland and Graham. Okay. So I need to know all of that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'll take this under advice. Yeah, like his deposition testimony. I bet you that's what it is. They've got the transcript from that case and they're going to impeach the hell out of him. Hope so. And how much time do you need to give me at least a general response now? Can you have it by Tuesday? We can do that, Your Honor. Okay. All right, so I'll hold off on that, Mr. Clark. Yes, Your Honor. All right. So number 29, Ms. Delally. So this motion. Uh, Attorney Little, uh, Eliza Little, Elizabeth Little is from LA. She is with Alan Jackson's firm. Your Honor uh, is essentially entitled uh, motion to eliminate for advance notice if defendant intends to cross-examine any witness about alleged bias uh, and request for a pretrial ruling on whether proposed evidence demonstrates plausible showing uh, of alleged bias. Uh, so the Commonwealth is not 
uh, stating that there are uh, no statements, uh, as the court is well aware, uh, that could uh, be interpreted to reflect uh, bias and could be used uh, by counsel in cross-examination. Uh, so uh, what the Commonwealth is not suggesting, uh, and bless you, is uh, for any prohibition on any statements whatsoever. What the Commonwealth is seeking here is uh, a ruling as to what precise uh, statements the defendant seeks to introduce uh, in regard to that uh, so that the court can make a ruling prior uh, to uh, the witness testifying before the jury as to exactly what's in play and what is going to be admissible and what's going to be allowed uh, as far as um, obviously it's not a perfect world and and if uh, a witness were to answer something in a way uh, that uh, would then um, open the door for for further material to come in that's understandable but at least a preliminary showing as to exactly what uh, the defendant submits are the statements they wish to introduce in relation to this issue isn't the defendant given broad range and cross-examination as to bias Yes, uh, and, and that's why I, I indicated early on uh, that I understand that there is a, some, um, that there certainly is uh, some areas uh, that under the law, whether or not they're true or not, are, are able to be explored as far as cross-examination is concerned. Uh, but what this motion simply seeks to address uh, is there are restrictions to that. It's, it's not unfettered. It's not, you know, just anything and everything that they could possibly think of or say as far as accusations go. Is there um, any particular type of testimony you're concerned about? I mean, is, is there anything in particular that you say they should not per be permitted to go into? Yeah, all of it. <laughs> yeah, all of it. Yeah. Based on what we've heard throughout the pendency of this case, is there anything... I mean, I'm reluctant to tie the defendant's hands in any way on cross-examination without knowing exactly what it is you think is improper. Okay. And what I would do, Your Honor, what I would uh, suggest is uh, similar to the other motions that we spoke of before, I can provide I can provide a supplemental with more specifics as to what the Commonwealth's concerns are, okay. uh, if the court would find that helpful. Yes, I, I can't rule on this as is. So is there any objection to that, Ms. Giannetti? You're nodding. Well, no, I, I think that makes sense. Okay. I, it was Ms. Little's uh, motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I saw you nodding. I don't want to step on her toes. Uh, no objection to that, Your Honor. Okay. All right, so why don't you do that? So sure. Mr. Clerk will hold off on ruling on this until we get something from the Commonwealth. Okay. So, so the Commonwealth will clarify. Right, and then no action taken. All right, so as you know, third party culprit and Bowden are often argued together, often presented together, why don't we just deal with the two motions together? So is this the good part, you guys? Is this the good part? Okay. All right. I think this is the good part coming. So I gave you a false start before. This is the real start. Commonwealth file, you're, you're number 30 and 31. Um, Mr. Lally, um, Mr. Yanetti, are you arguing both? Does it make sense to sort of keep them together? I agree that they should be kept together. Yeah. All right. So why don't I hear you as to your concerns on both? And and as you know, sometimes third party culprit as it goes to Bowdoin is different than just straight third party culprit. And actually, it might save us a lot of time. Is that what you intend to do, Mr. Yanetti? Third party culprit as it well, goes to Bowdoin or straight third party culprit as well? Definitely third party culprit as it goes to Bowdoin, that's for sure. Um, and then depending on how the evidence develops at trial, um, there may be uh, you know, an, uh, an offer to offer third party culprit evidence with regard to third party culprits. But for those of you just joining who don't know, a Bowdoin defense is arguing that the shoddy investigation is to blame here or the lack of investigation or the sloppy investigation, or the messed up investigation, or the lack of an investigation altogether is to blame. And that's your defense, that they didn't investigate the things that they should have, 
the evidence was mishandled, et cetera, et cetera. Third party culprit is blaming uh, another person, a third party for the crime, and they often go hand in hand. But I think I can speak further to that in response. So go ahead, you can argue these however you want to argue them. No, it, and, and I, I would argue them sort of in that vein, Your Honor. So understanding that um, based on the state of the evidence, uh, as I anticipated to be, uh, and in any case, regardless, uh, I think a defendant in any criminal case has a much better um, um, shot, essentially, at getting evidence in regarding to Bowdoin as sort of a backdoor through, uh, excuse me, as to third party culprit as sort of a backdoor through uh, a Bowdoin defense. Uh, so what I'm primarily concerned with, Your Honor, is, is uh, motion eliminate number 30. Um, because as the court- oh, We're not coming through the back door. Mr. Lally, says the defense team, we're coming right through the front door and we're going to bang the damn thing down with a battering ram. The court is well aware uh, there have been a number of, of theories of uh, sort of uh, speculation, rank speculation, uh, opinions uh, without any evidentiary support, uh, names of certain people that have been dropped at this microphone by counsel at different uh, pretrial hearings uh, who are not witnesses, who have nothing to do with this case, who don't know anything about this case, uh, who counsel when they said those names and sort of dropped those whatever they supported to be facts, uh, knew that they had nothing to say and nothing to do with this case. Um, what I'm uh, concerned about is whatever is acceptable as far as uh, uh, believability when it comes to arguing things in pretrial motions, shouting things from courthouse steps, or, you know, bandying about on Twitter is, is not what we do here. Um, and so now it is a time where uh, counsel is going to be relegated to what is actual, admissible, relevant evidence. Uh, and what I'm uh, asking uh, for in this motion is for the de defendant through her counsel to actually provide any admissible or relevant evidence that pertains to third party culprit, which to this point they have not done. Uh, so if this is something that's going to be raised as an issue on its own, uh, as the court is well aware, what the uh, case law indicates is that the acts uh, of the other person are so closely connected in point of time and method of operation as to cast doubt upon the identification of the defendant as a person who committed the crime. It has to be specific. Um, it has to be uh, to at least a specific realm of person. Uh, or a specifically identified no, person uh, who would not. have motive, opportunity uh, to commit uh, the act with which the defendant... Oh, you better want what you wish for. Gotta have mode, opportunity. It has to be specific. Um, it has to be uh, to at least a specific realm of person uh, or a specifically identified person uh, who would have motive, opportunity uh, to commit uh, the act with which the defendant is charged. And up until this point, I have not seen anything uh, specific as to that. As it pertains uh, to uh, the Bowdoin uh, motion the Commonwealth filed, what the Commonwealth is asking for there is, is notice and, and voir dire in relation uh, to a Bowdoin defense. So if there is, uh, again, going to be some, you know, it, it's, I don't think the evidence comes anywhere close uh, to a Bowdoin instruction, uh, but certainly uh, what the courts have said uh, over time uh, is that uh, a Bowdoin defense is something that uh, if the evidence warrants it, uh, counsel can uh, elicit testimony in regard to it uh, or attempt to uh, and uh, make arguments in reference to it. So I'm not seeking to preclude uh, counsel from, from making arguments or from counsel asking questions. What I'm uh, seeking clarification on is, is what uh, exactly uh, and again, this is from a position of, of operating without any information whatsoever as, as to what uh, a defense may be. And understanding uh, that uh, counsel was not required uh, to provide any information until the Commonwealth filed its certificate of compliance. Uh, but there's been, regardless of whether they were required to or not, I, I'm, I'm going into trial on Tuesday without any information whatsoever as to as to who they've spoken to, what they're in, uh, what statements they might be, who their witnesses are, or anything of that nature. Uh, so it's Billy Tibbetts. Billy Tibbetts is in the chat. Free my boy, Billy Tibbetts. Said guy made a tie out of my own couch. My old couch. Guy made a tie out of my old couch. All right. 
Get ready to be schooled, Ali. For those reasons, the Commonwealth uh, feels it appropriate to at least file a motion to be given notice as to exactly uh, what the defendant intends to do. Um, this the trial by ambush is simply not something that's permitted oh. uh, uh, by the case law, uh, and that's what the Commonwealth is seeking to uh, to prohibit in that second motion. Thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, Here we go. All right, Mr. Nettie, I'll hear you. Thank you. And though they're argued together, I do want you to also start with the third party culprit alone, not third party. No, I'm going to tell you how to make your argument, Mr. Yanetti. You're going to listen to what I have to say. How about he makes his argument the way he wants to make his argument, the way he's planned to make his argument. You don't just change it up on him and say, here's how I want you to argue it. That's just in poor form. Culprit as it goes to Bowdoin but third party culprit alone because of all those factors that I told you, as you well know, the case law is clear that I have to consider. And if I had to do it now, and you know, I can do it pretrial, right? You know that I can today, I can just exclude it. I'm Sounds like a warning. Sounds like a warning shot was just fired. What say you, you know, I can do it right now. You know, I can. Not inclined to do that, but I need to be able to make those decisions to to weigh those factors because right now I have zero information. On right, this. I understand that, Your Honor, and uh, that was my plan going into today anyway. Uh, so the, the initial question is, um, why is there a third party culprit defense? Why is it relevant? Um, and we start, Your Honor, with the fact that our forensic medical examiner, Frank Sheridan, um, you know, a pathologist, forensic pathologist who has, uh, performed himself thousands and thousands of autopsies, has already submitted a sworn affidavit to this court that John O'Keefe's injuries are consistent with having been in a fight and are not consistent with having been hit by a car. Uh, since he submitted that affidavit, the federal authorities have provided us with their reports, whereby mm -hmm. FBI experts also corroborate that John O'Keefe's injuries are not consistent with having been hit by a car. They employed experts in biomechanics and kinematics who have reviewed the evidence in this case, and they've confirmed that the physical evidence uh, conf uh, essentially shows and doesn't show what Dr. Sheridan has opined. So therefore, <clears throat> if John O'Keefe was not hit by a car, that means that Cameron Reed did not kill him. And we know that John O'Keefe did not die of natural causes. This was not a heart attack or a stroke. John O'Keefe was injured. He was mortally injured. If he was not hit by a car, as both our expert and FBI confirmed, then he was attacked. And if, if he was not hit by a car, then there is a third party culprit or culprits. Of course. So by asking this court to prohibit the defense from introducing evidence that others had the motive, opportunity, and the means to attack John O'Keefe. The Commonwealth is essentially asking this court to prohibit Karen Reed from being able to defend herself. So I, I don't think they're asking that you be prohibited from doing that. They're asking first to have you tell them what that is. Right. Well, this is, you know, Your Honor, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that in terms of the, right, so go, go ahead. You, have, you have your that, remarks. That we're either required to give them or not. Um, you know, it is not our job to solve this case for the prosecution. It's our mm -hmm. contention. They had the opportunity to do that, but they failed. It is not our job to name a specific third party culprit. We do not have to prove that Brian Albert or Colin Albert or Brian Higgins or some combination of them intended to kill John O'Keefe. We don't have to prove that any of them attacked John O'Keefe such that he eventually died. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they didn't. But the fact of the matter is there is evidence that all three of them had a motive, had they, the opportunity and the means to attack John O'Keefe. Now the, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Conkey in their motion. And as this court started the discussion on this issue when you first <laughs> took the bench, Conkey makes clear that a defendant has a constitutional right to argue that somebody else may have committed the crime. And certainly, no, the acts of that person can't be too attenuated in time or method of operation, as Mr. Lally uh, mentions. But in terms of being the right time period, Your Honor, you can't get any closer than their presence at the scene at the very time 
that John O'Keefe was killed. And in terms of the method of operation, given that we have evidence that he was not hit by a car and that he was attacked, all three of these men, either alone or in combination, possessed the ability to attack him with or without a weapon. I mean, that's a very low standard here. The Commonwealth acknowledges that. It's a low standard of simple relevance. And the evidence here establishes relevance. Now, I would note, Your Honor, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Finney. I don't know if they realize this, but that was my case. I That's his case! That's his case! The Commonwealth cited a case that was actually Yanetti's case. Can you not even make this up? Thank Mike S. for saying some advice when citing case law. Make sure the defense attorney that you are arguing against wasn't the one who helped set the precedent. Represented Roland Douglas Philly before the Supreme Judicial Court, and I represented him at his motion for new trial and at his retrial. And that case, the Finney case, provides strong support for the introduction of third party culprit evidence here, um, irrespective of a Bowdoin defense. Um, in fact, the reason that Mr. Finney's conviction was overturned was that his trial counsel failed to pursue, pursue a third-party culprit defense. And, Your Honor, the third-party culprit defense in Finney was weaker, far weaker, than the third-party culprit defense we have here. The evidence of motive in that case was that the third-party culprit made derogatory statements about the victim after she was murdered. No witness in that case put the two of them together. No witness in that case put the third party culprit at the scene of the murder where the victim was murdered. There was some consciousness of guilt evidence similar to what we have in this case. But in Finney, the SJC ruled that not only was that enough for a defense attorney to present a, a third party culprit defense, but he was ineffective for not doing so. And as the, the court uh, has also- uh, uh, It's like stands for the opposite of what he wanted to prove. He was citing it for the reason that he shouldn't be allowed to uh, show d to um, present a third party culprit defense unless it was specific. And he's saying that's exactly what the problem was, was that his attorney did not present a third party culprit defense. Wow. Touched upon. Uh, the, the SJC found that on the basis of that third party culprit evidence, which is weaker than what we have here, there were substantial connecting links between that third party culprit that justified the admission of hearsay in that case. And I want to make it clear, we're, we're not looking to introduce any hearsay statements, so we're, we don't need substantial connecting links here. Now, Your Honor, I could go through with the court the specific evidence we have with regard to motive, opportunity, and means with regard to the three Commonwealth witnesses that I've named. So uh, go ahead. Specific evidence uh, we okay, go ahead. This opens up the entire can of worms. This is everything right now. Ready? She says, go ahead. Now, Your Honor, I could go through with the court the specific evidence we have with regard to motive, opportunity, and means with regard to the three Commonwealth witnesses that I've named. So uh, go ahead. Happy to do it. Uh, starting with Brian Higgins. He was present at 34 Fairview Road on January 28th to 29th. He was close friends with the homeowner, Brian Albert. He had a prior romantic interest in Karen Reed. He did not expect Karen and John O'Keefe to be at the waterfall, that bar on January 28th. Karen Reed did not greet Higgins, despite the fact that they had previously exchanged flirtatious texts and that she had uh, been at his apartment one evening, although there was nothing that took place between them any more than a peck of a kiss. Okay, they're admitting to those text messages that we went over that the Commonwealth, uh, we found that the Commonwealth submitted that stuff to the state grand jury in one of the motions and admitting to the peck, now it was a kiss, now it's a peck, they said it happened in the garage after a Patriots playoff game. So they're admitting she had a flirtatious relationship with Higgins, that there was a peck at his apartment, that she went there, and that he was mad that she she didn't know that she was going to be at the water. I got to just rewind this because this is tick, tick, boom. 
She didn't say hi to him when she walked into the waterfall, and he was pissed. I a romantic interest in Karen Reed. He did not expect Karen and John O'Keefe to be at the waterfall, that bar on January 28th. Karen Reed did not greet Higgins, despite the fact that they had previously exchanged flirtatious texts and that she had uh, been at his apartment one evening, although there was nothing that took place between them any more than a peck of a kiss. At the waterfall, Higgins does not engage with John O'Keefe. He does not say goodbye to John O'Keefe and Karen when he leaves, but before he leaves, he texts Karen, and that text was something to the effect of, um, well, with a lot of M's. Uh, we He's texting Karen, Brian Higgins is texting Karen from the water, uh, at the waterfall, while she's with her boyfriend. We know that there was a preservation order from this court, your predecessor, Judge Krupp, to preserve his cell phone, and that Trooper Proctor gave an, uh, him an edict, um, to, to uh, you know, an order to serve uh, on Brian Higgins, and he left it at the front desk of the Canton Police Station for him, and that Higgins, we learned through the federal investigation, Higgins became angry, demanded that Proctor uh, come back, and he essentially upbraided him and read him the riot act, which shows a little bit about Higgins' personality. Um, at the end of the night, everyone discussed going back to 34 Fairview, and when he gets back to 34 Fairview, he texts not Karen, he texts John O'Keefe at 12.20 a.m. He testified before the federal- What did he testify? What did he text to John O'Keefe? I wanna know. Anybody know? Grand jury, 12 Fairview, he texts not Karen 34 Fairview. And when he gets back to 34 Fairview, he texts not Karen, he texts John O'Keefe at 12.20 a.m. He testified before the federal grand jury that he had no knowledge that they had been invited to 34 Fairview, but that is contradicted by this text message. And the inference is that he was coaxing John to come to that house. And, you know, we're not saying this gives him a motive to kill John, but we don't have to show that. Uh, any motive to feel hostility or animosity towards John O'Keefe um, goes to his motive. And Your Honor, when Brian Higgins and Brian Albert are in that house, they're the only two people who are unaccounted for when the rest of the group was in the kitchen. And they claimed that they were looking at photographs together. And we have evidence that they were in the basement. We believe that- Evidence that they were in the basement. Brian Higgins and Brian Albert were in the basement. Brian Albert made a mistake before the state grand jury by testifying they went upstairs to look at photos. Brian Higgins says unequivocally that the only place the two went was into the living room to look at photos and military ribbons, whatever they were looking at. Brian Higgins did not know that Brian Albert had said they went upstairs. And he also testified he had never been upstairs at Brian Albert's house in his life. Never been upstairs in his life. In his life. Somebody who knows, tell me this, because I had a question about this immediately. Didn't Caitlin Albert testify that her father, Brian, was giving Higgins a tour around the upstairs of the house? Did she testify to that and that she thought it was odd? Tell me. I'm going to wait on that Caitlin answer because I thought Caitlin testified to that. That they were upstairs. Charlene says yes. Yes. So when he says we went upstairs, it's because they went upstairs from the basement. Higgins testified that he never has been upstairs in that house in his life. So who told Caitlin to say that they were upstairs? Hmm. 
that means that if Brian Albert said they went upstairs, they're coming up from the basement. And before leaving 34 Fairview, Brian Higgins testified he was parked right in front of the mailbox. He would have had to have walked by where John O'Keefe's body was. His headlights when he got in his vehicle would have been illuminating where John O'Keefe's body would have been in the yard if it were actually there. So how does he not see it? He then goes back to the Canton Police Station at 1.30 in the morning after leaving 34 Fairview. He claimed to do some administrative work, but then he admitted to the federal grand jury that he was there to move his car because of the upcoming snowstorm. <clears throat> this suggests that he was fabricating a reason for going back to Canton Police to establish an alibi for himself. Um, he was asked several times and you might be saying to yourself right now, I can't believe Judge Canoni is just letting him go on and on and on like this. Well, <laughs> hold on. Times at the federal grand jury. If he had any conversations with anyone before he went to bed, uh, and when was he notified that John O'Keefe was dead? In the morning, he said. He testified under the pains and penalties of perjury that he had absolutely no contact with any person that night for any reason whatsoever but he apparently was surprised that the federal authorities had subpoenaed his phone records and he had to admit, and he did admit under oath, he made that 2.22 a.m. phone call around the same, to about uh, you know, five minutes before Jennifer McCabe is Googling how long to die in the cold, about eight minutes before Brian Laughlin, the plow driver, first drives by the house and sees nobody at all. And the next morning, Brian Higgins, the first thing, first person he spoke to was Brian Albert. After right, I'm, I'm going to stop you for a minute. I think we need a break, Madam Court Reporter. Do you need a break? Can you go? How much longer do you think you have with this, Mr. Unetti? How many more pages or how long you think? Yeah. Madam Court Reporter, do you need a break right now? Uh, they started at what? Like 930. It's only two hours and 10 minutes into it. So do you think the court reporter needs a break? Really? Right in the middle of his flow? Right, right when he's ready to drop a whole bunch more bombs? I was outraged. Wow. Look at the blonde girl behind him. Everyone's saying, look at her. She, people are like, she's my spirit animal. Now I've got about, uh, in terms of my recitation of the facts, uh, I've done about a page and a half, and I've got three left. Madam Court Reporter, would you like to take a little break? It's hot in here, and you've been going nonstop. Okay, let's take a 10-minute break. 10-minute break. Uh, she's, I got to go take a phone call. I got to make a phone call. I can't believe I allowed him to go, and, like, what am I going to – you think Katie says she wants to stop to call Brian Higgins? This is amazing. Somebody's calling her Goldilocks in, in the courtroom. Oh, it took, it was 27 minutes long, this break. She said 10 minutes, then it was 28. Wow. Um, this is insane. But wait, there's more. So I guess after 28 minutes, they're going to come back. And this was weird because this happened in the middle. And I thought, oh no, this is not a test. This is not a test. Insane. I was like, oh my God, they're going to cut it off. They're never coming back. It's over. They're going to claim the camera's broken. But alas, 28 minutes later. All right, Ms. Tianetti, go right ahead. Thank you. Your Honor, I left off with the uh, morning of January 29th. The first person that Brian Higgins spoke to was Brian Albert. 
Um, he had missed a call from Chief Kenneth Berkowitz earlier. Um, immediately after getting off the phone with Brian Albert, Brian Higgins drives back to 34 Fairview, where he has a meeting with uh, just about all the witnesses in this case, Brian Albert, Julie Albert, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, and immediately after that, friends and... I don't even know if this is where he really left off, because, wait, hold on a second. All right, so now he's to the morning of the 29th. They, go, he, they talk about the butt dial call. And now he's still on Higgins, morning of the 29th. Your Honor, I left off with the uh, morning of January 29th. The first person that Brian Higgins spoke to was Brian Albert. Um, he had missed a call from Chief Kenneth Berkowitz earlier. Um, immediately after getting off the phone with Brian Albert, Brian Higgins drives back to 34 Fairview, where he has a meeting with uh, just about all the witnesses in this case, Brian Albert, Julie Albert, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, and immediately after that friends and family meeting on his day off, which is a Saturday. Higgins had a meeting with all of them? Did we know this? That Higgins had a friends and family meeting? He said Higgins, right? He's not saying Berkowitz. I got to rewind that just to make sure because I don't think we knew that Higgins had a meeting with everyone. For those of you who don't know, Berkowitz was the chief of police of Canton PD. And he was on medical leave. That's right. Off the phone with Brian Albert earlier. The first person that Brian Higgins spoke to was Brian Albert. Um, he had missed a call from Chief Kenneth Berkowitz earlier. Um, immediately after getting off the phone with Brian Albert, Brian Higgins drives back to 34 Fairview where he has a meeting with uh, just about all the witnesses in this case, Brian Albert, Julie Albert, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe. And immediately after that friends and family meeting on his day off, which is a Saturday, he returns to the Canton Police Department where he speaks with all of the first responding officers who had anything to do with this case. So this is a quote unquote witness accessing and communicating with all the first responding officers, we would argue monitoring what they're doing in regard to the investigation. According to Brian Higgins, he admitted that Chief Berkowitz is one of his best friends and that's why he had access to all these people. We have a law enforcement witness who will testify to seeing Chief Kenneth Berkowitz and Brian Higgins alone with Karen Reed's vehicle on the afternoon of January 29th of 2022 for quote, a wildly long time. So is this a name that's been in the materials? Is this, is this a name known? They have a law enforcement officer who is going to say that Berkowitz, and who does, who do you say Proctor? Hold on. We're with the vehicle for alone with the vehicle and the cameras didn't work. It all goes to the taillight evidence, you guys. And Brian Higgins alone with Karen Reed's vehicle. Higgins and Berkowitz alone with the vehicle. Vehicle on the afternoon of January 29th of 2022 for quote, a wildly long time. So is this a name that's been in the materials? Is this, is this a name known to the Commonwealth? Or yes. Is this somebody new? Okay. We, and we've now received video surveillance from the Canton Police Department that shows that there is an interior camera in the Sallyport garage where the car was housed. But in, during the exact time that that third party officer indicates that Berkowitz and Higgins were in the Sally Port together, the video mysteriously cuts out for 42 minutes between. Of course it does, because there's only one more missing video in this case. Can there be any more missing video in this case after the cops are alone with the car, Karen's car? You should be outraged. 508 between 508 and 550 p.m. And just to be 
clear here, we never get to see the condition of the taillight when it's brought into the garage. When we do see the car, we see it after Brian Higgins, Chief Berkowitz, Michael Proctor, and Yuri Buknik have all had access to it at 536. That's huge. That is huge. Because up until now, people were speculating about how long it would have taken them to find some pieces of taillight. And then all of a sudden the taillight's discovered after the time that the car arrived at, of course, the Canton Sally Port, the Sally Port in Canton. And of course the video is missing and they're going to say it's motion activated, but it moved from the outside to the inside. It would have been activated, blah, 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 enough. 6 p.m. the car pings that it's arrived in the Sally Port. That's during the missing video. Trooper Proctor, Trooper Buchnick never sees Brian Higgins' phone. They speak with him and he takes it upon himself to use his own resources, Brian Higgins, within the federal government to ask a friend. He used his job as a Fed to get another Fed to pull his phone records. And that's why he printed up those text messages. Remember, we were so curious. Why would he bring up uh, all his printed up text messages with him? Here's why. He used federal resources to do it. Special Agent Mac Kelch to download only the text messages in his phone between Karen and him and him and John. And that's it. We have to take his word for it that we got all of them. And we certainly don't have any communications between him this and Matt Ke Albert. Who is this Matt Kelch? He's going to be up on charges. <laughs> I mean, he could be, unless he's he's agreeing to cooperate too. For instance, on February 10th, when he shows up to his interview with Troopers Buchnick and Proctor, he brings with them copies of the text that he has deemed relevant mm -hmm. in their murder investigation. And he hands them the copies of the extraction that he had his friend do he then calls Matt Kelch the weekend uh, of this uh, uh, incident uh, to do the limited extraction. He never tells uh, Trooper Buchnick or Trooper Prochner how he extracted the tests, uh, despite the fact that it was done by a friend of his in the federal government. Um, during the federal proffer, Brian Higgins... During the federal proffer, Brian Higgins admits, just kind of snuck it in there. I will tell you what a federal proffer is. A federal proffer is an offer of proof from a witness in a federal investigation in order to either receive immunity or leniency. That is what a federal proffer is. All the speculation about Brian Higgins flipping seems to be correct. Seems to be correct, my friends. This is a federal proffer by Brian Higgins in order to make a deal. It's called Let's Make a Deal. I'll tell you what I know, but I either want immunity or I want leniency if you're still going to come after me. This is huge. Huge. So huge that I'm going to just Rewinded a sentence. Prochner, how he extracted the tests, uh, despite the fact that it was done by a friend of his in the federal government. Um, during the federal proffer, Brian Higgins admits that he had been served with a preservation order and the Commonwealth told him he could destroy his phone despite the order. He then drives to a military base on Cape Cod, opens his phone, breaks the SIM card and throws the phone away. Did you catch that? Drives to a military base, which is federal property. Opens his phone, breaks the SIM card, and throws the phone away, despite the fact that they had a preservation order for him to preserve his phone. Okay? Okay? And now, now we know why they wanted the phone records of Brian Albert and Kevin Albert and Brian Higgins, because... Brian Albert was freaking out that Brian Higgins ghosted him when he got served with the federal subpoena and he had Kevin Albert, his brother, who's a Canton PD, 
reach out to Higgins. Like, why are you ghosting my brother? Everyone got a federal subpoena except for you. Yeah. And he says that he discussed destroying his phone with Brian Albert. Brian Albert also destroyed his phone. And Brian Albert uh, said that he had uh, received some text that concerns him as an explanation. And after that, Brian Higgins changes his phone number and changes his cell carrier. In short, he was present that night. He had a motive and there is plenty of consciousness of guilt cover up evidence with regard to Mr. Higgins. Moving on to Colin Albert. Shortly before January 29th of 2022, Colin Albert lived with his parents, Christopher Albert and Julie Albert on John O'Keefe's street, just two doors down. We have evidence of bad blood between Colin Albert and John O'Keefe. We have evidence. How old, how old was Colin Albert at that time? I believe he was 16 at that time. Okay. We have evidence that Colin Albert and John O'Keefe used to get in confrontations because Colin Albert used to cut through his yard without permission and John O'Keefe was not happy about that. We have evidence that Colin Albert used to throw beer cans intentionally into John O'Keefe's bushes and John O'Keefe was not happy, happy about that. We have evidence that Christopher and Julie Albert knew of this conflict. We have evidence that they referred to John O'Keefe uh, as Nebercracker. That's a character from, a, I think, a kid's movie uh, who was known as the get off my lawn guy. When John O'Keefe and Karen Reed were vacationing in Aruba over New Year's Eve 2022, the Alberts, Christopher and Julie, taunted him. They went to his porch and they had photos taken of themselves drinking on John's property when he wasn't there to do anything about it, evidencing they knew how upset he was at what Colin Albert had been doing. Classy, huh? They're in Aruba and they go. Kevin and Julie Albert, the parents of Colin, go to John O'Keefe's porch and take pictures of themselves drinking beers on his porch. And what? Post them on Instagram, post them on Snapchat, post them on Facebook, send them to John O'Keefe to piss him off, to rile him up. Classy. And yet the Commonwealth has said that Kevin Albert is not going to be on their witness list. And you know there were conflicting statements about whether uh, Kevin, it's Kevin, Kevin and Julie went back to, is it Chris and Julie or Kevin and Julie? Chris and Julie went back to the house at 34 Fairview. I just want to make sure I have this right because I thought I said Kevin, but I think it's Chris and Julie. Um, is anybody watching this that hasn't seen it already? Cause I've already watched it three times and it, and it astonishes me every single time. So if you're just seeing this for the first time, I'd like to hear from you. That's a character from a, I think a kid's movie. Uh, who was known as the get off my lawn guy. When John O'Keefe and Karen Reed were vacationing in Aruba over New Year's Eve 2022, the Alberts, Christopher and Julie, taunted him. They went to his porch and they had photos taken of themselves drinking on John's property when he wasn't there to do anything about Julie. it, evidencing they knew how upset he was at what Colin Albert had been doing. Now. The investigators in this case, Your Honor, including Michael Proctor, kept Colin Albert's name completely out of the police report. When this case began, I had no idea who Colin Albert was. Um, I received a tip right from the jump that Brian Albert and his nephew had beaten up John O'Keefe. I didn't even know Brian o Albert had a nephew at that time. But after receiving the tip, I learned of the conflict that Colin Albert had with John O'Keefe so I sent a letter to Mr. Lally, I believe by certified mail. I knew that the DA's office was planning to present evidence or witnesses to a grand jury. And at that early juncture, before anybody uh, had, been, had asked them to indict, um, I notified the DA of three potential suspects, the ones that I'm talking about now, Brian Higgins, Brian Albert, and Colin Albert. 
Um, after he received that letter at our next court appearance, I'm sure Mr. Lally can confirm this, um, he acknowledged that both Brian Albert and Brian Higgins would be testifying or had testified before the grand jury, but he questioned why I included Colin Albert in my letter. He told me at the time that he had no evidence that Colin Albert was there that night. However, after receiving my letter, lo and behold, multiple witnesses testified that Colin Albert was at 34 Fairview the night of January 28th to 29th. And now the DA will argue, I'm sure, at trial that he left before Joan O'Keefe arrived. We don't find their evidence compelling. We don't accept it. We are not required to accept their theory of the case. We're entitled to present a defense. His presence at 34 Fairview gave him the opportunity, along with the motive, to harm John O'Keefe. With regard to Brian Albert, Your Honor, um, this is a well-connected, well-known, powerful family in the town of Canton, Massachusetts. Brian Albert was present at that home when Colin Albert was there. <coughs> Colin Albert is a member of the Albert family. He's nephew of Brian Albert. We have evidence that Brian Albert had expressed hostility toward John O'Keefe as well. And we know that he initiated a phone call with Brian Higgins at 2.22 in the morning. He reached out to Brian Higgins. And then he picked up the phone when Brian Higgins came back and they spoke for 22 seconds, and they never revealed any of that to investigators. Again, consciousness of guilt, and perhaps most of all, Brian Albert is a first responder. He is duty-bound to help somebody who's in trouble. He was notified that John O'Keefe was in trouble. Brian Albert stayed in his home. He knew what was going on outside. His sister-in-law was out there, civilians, medical personnel eventually arrived. He did nothing. That is also consciousness of guilt. Now, Your Honor, with regard to all of that third-party culprit evidence to admit it substantively, which I would assert to the court is, is both overwhelming and powerful. With regard to the Bowdoin uh, argument here, the police investigated none of that. That didn't come from the Commonwealth. They had a, a complete lack of curiosity as to what was going on in that house that night. They didn't care. Investigators never went in. Yep, been saying that since day one. The feds investigated, and that's where we got a majority of this evidence. So, you know, to, to the extent that the Commonwealth now claims that they didn't have notice of this, um, I, I beg to defer. They, they got notice of this when we got notice of this. Uh, you know, the Finney case, Your Honor, again, I'm, I'm well familiar. Because he told them. Because he told them. And they didn't investigate it. Yes, it should be an outrage to any decent person. Thank you, little cupcake. Yes, and it is shocking, Lisa, that Bev is not interrupting. And he is well familiar with the Finney case because it was his case. With it, it stood for the proposition that, you know, if, if you want to point the finger at a third party culprit, you've got a constitutional right to do that. And if you want to point out inadequacies in a police investigation, you have a constitutional right yeah. to do that. Yeah. It is for those reasons that I ask you to deny the Commonwealth's motions. <sighs> okay. Thank you. you hear that? Any response, Mr. Lally? Uh, briefly, Your Honor. <coughs> okay. So here, this is Sheila. Sheila, this is the first time that she's watching this case with us, with anyone. Sheila says, I've never heard more than five minutes of this case at one time. I've been here this whole time, and I am utterly shocked, to be honest. The wrong person is on trial. Thank you, Sheila, for coming in and listening to it because this is a fact-based channel and everything, and no matter what they say about me on Twitter, everything that I have ever said on this channel comes from court documents and hearings and police reports and investigative reports. 
And I am accused of all sorts of things on Twitter, including going on vacation to Cancun with Alan Jackson, the defense attorney, to see Dave Matthews, and being paid by the defense team to make these videos as if this is the only case I cover. So thank you, Sheila, for coming and listening to what is going on in the actual case and giving it a chance. We appreciate that. Um, just first, uh, again, what, what the case law requires is evidence and not just mere speculation or saying that you have evidence is not actually evidence. Um, I, I do find it somewhat interesting that Mr. Yannetti uh, wrote apparently four and a half pages of notes but didn't have time to write a motion uh, to admit uh, the evidence uh, that he claims that he has. Um, he references in regard to uh, third party culprit, uh, Dr. Sheridan, uh, who indicated that the injuries are consistent with the fight. He's the same doctor who indicated that the injuries on uh, Mr. O'Keefe's arm were consistent with the dog bite, which was then refuted by the DNA findings from UC Davis, as well as the fact that the injuries are only on one side of the arm. And last time I checked, uh, dogs have teeth uh, on the top and the bottom, and there's no injuries to the bottom. Of Mr. O'Keefe's arm. Okay, well, we had a question about that. We didn't know if there were injuries to the bottom of Mr. O'Keefe's arm because we don't even know if a picture was taken of the bottom of Officer O'Keefe's arm, by the way. And perhaps he should go watch my stream with Garrett Wing, the dog trainer, who says the reason for that is that dogs who are untrained take shallow bites. And if somebody was on their back, perhaps, when they were being bitten, there would be no bottom teeth marks. So, um, again... Now, I think he's opened the door for them to bring in an expert of such this kind, if he can pass a, a Dalbert hearing. But there's no injuries to the bottom of his arm. If they've even taken pictures of the bottom of his arm. And uh, Brandy, I'm with you, girl. I did not get a 1099. Brandy, who also has an amazing YouTube channel, go uh, subscribe to Brandy. We did a stream together recently, but she's got charts and graphs and family trees and all kinds of stuff if you feel confused right now. Uh, and Brandy says, I heard that uh, she heard that she and I are paid by Karen Reed and she needs to know before she files her taxes because she didn't get the memo about that. Me neither. I didn't get my 1099 either. So, you know, I, I girl, I saw what was happening to you on Twitter and I'm like, just walk away. Just I'll walk away. It's crazy. And now he's going to argue about the dog bites. I mean, you're going from Higgins flipping to the feds and taking a federal proffer to dog bites. Like that wasn't mind blowing for you. Like you're going to, you're going to not even talk about Julie and, and Chris Albert taking pictures on John O'Keefe's porch, drinking beers with probably with their middle finger up. Cause I've seen a picture of them with their son all with the middle finger up. Like that's real classy too. Um, so just because Chris Albert is not on the witness list of the Commonwealth doesn't mean he's not going to be on the defense's witness list. That'll be interesting. In regard to uh, third party culprit, uh, Dr. Sheridan, uh, who indicated that the injuries are consistent with the fight. He's the same doctor who indicated that the injuries on uh, Mr. O'Keefe's arm were consistent with the dog bite, which was then refuted by the DNA findings from UC Davis, as well as the fact that the injuries are only on one side of the arm. And last time I checked, uh, dogs have teeth uh, on the top and the bottom, and there's no injuries to the bottom of Mr. O'Keefe's arm. Uh, furthermore, <clears throat> the council references the federal grand jury materials in which uh, I would say, uh, as has been done numerous times previously, is, is severely mischaracterized as to what they actually contain. Uh, so what, uh, the, and it's not a crash reconstructionist as it's been alleged here before, it's a biomechanical engineer. And essentially what they did was take painstaking lengths uh, to go to, uh, to determine that uh, the defendant's vehicle did not strike uh, Mr. O'Keefe in the back of the head, which is simply something that no one has ever said, intimated at any point ever. Um, there is also a medical examiner uh, in the federal materials who concurs uh, completely with Dr. Scordy Bellow's uh, findings as it pertains uh, to the cause and manner of death. Uh, that, it, <laughs> that he was caused by blunt force trauma to the head? Because that's what Irene Scordy Bellow's report says. Blunt force trauma to the head and hypothermia. 
But she puts in her report that doesn't belong there. This is not consistent. These injuries are not consistent with being in a fight or there's no indication that he was in a fight. She also didn't say there's no indication that he was there, that there is an indication that he was in a car accident. This I am sure that he is misconstruing in the way that he does the word salad, but I, I we'll see. We'll see. It'll be interesting. So with regard oh, to that's what I was going to say. Multiple skull fractures, a blunt force trauma to the head. Does anybody know if John, uh, if officer John O'Keefe had a fractured nose because they keep saying multiple skull fractures, that could also mean a fractured nose. We haven't seen the autopsy report. Somebody said, why are they doing this? This is what they're going to go at tr present a trial. No, this is this is a hearing to determine whether or not this stuff will be allowed in a trial. So we are getting preview to some stuff the jurors might not even hear. So that's what this is about. The final pretrial conference. Each of these. The other thing that I would point out is if counsel was uh, counsel record with the Finney case, the Finney case relates to third party culprit under the Bowdoin event. So it's not applicable to what counsel uh, was arguing. Um, it is a low standard, but it's also one that the defendant here has not met. It's not one without limits. Uh, as it pertains to much of, of the material uh, that it was uh, summarized uh, as far as uh, speculation as to what different things uh, counsel feels mean uh, from, from various uh, things regarding Mr. Higgins, uh, Colin Albert, and Brian Albert, just starting with Colin Albert, because that's frankly the easiest. He wasn't at the house, and that's what the federal materials confirm with each of every single of the witnesses that were spoken to by uh, the district attorney's office or the troopers or testified to the state grand jury. They testified to the exact same things in the federal grand jury, that Colin Albert had left the house prior to uh, the defendant and the victim arriving there, and there's absolutely nothing uh, to combat that whatsoever uh, other than, again, just rank speculation. So opportunity would be a little bit amiss uh, if he's not even there at the same time uh, as Mr. O'Keefe, regardless of, of the invalidity of any sort of, uh, you know, ill feelings or ongoing feud uh, that's purported uh, from whatever unknown evidence uh, counsel claims to have. In regard to Mr. Higgins, uh, that, that was a fanciful story. But okay. again, there's actually no action. That was a fanciful story. Oh, do you not know that he turned states' evidence? Do you not know that, or or states' evidence, United States federal evidence, that he's he made a proffer deal? You think it's a fanciful story? Okay, go with that. Actual word evidence of of most of those things, uh, or at least the the imputations or the connotations, uh, the council wants to put uh, behind uh, that. Um, whatever he feels uh, things were observed. Um, so again, I'm not sure where the evidence uh, from this is coming from. Uh, what I'm also a little confused in regard to is that if counsel is merely relying on materials within the federal grand jury. Wait, who's Laura Lane? It'll be wonderful in a few weeks when you will see how we were right and you were deceived by Karen Reed and her team. You'll enjoy it? Okay, good. Oh, I, that's great that I pulled this up right now. Welcome. Welcome, Laura Lane. Who's we? Who's we? You and who? You and a couple of other friends and family? Laura, Laura, and this is a totally serious question. Like, what is the evidence that he was hit by a car? Just, just point to one piece of evidence that shows that Officer John O'Keefe was hit by a car. That's all I want to know. Give me one. Give me one. Where are any lower body injuries aside from the the marks on his arm and the boxer fractures on his um, knuckles. Where are any lower body injuries below the neck that would be caused from a pedestrian versus car motor vehicle? I'll wait for it because when Helen Rafferty hit an, an, a guy with a reflective vest in a crosswalk in February, forgot to tell the people of Canton, by the way, in her police issued vehicle, that person had multiple surgeries to the knee. Where are the injuries? Just seriously, I'm legitimately asking you, where is the proof that he was hit by a car? I don't know what happened to him, but he did not die from a car accident. There's no evidence. So 
the fact that you think that we are being deceived by Karen and her team, we're looking at the evidence. We are looking at the court documents. We are looking at the hearings. We are listening to them argue. I don't know who you're listening to. All the trolls. His hair was on the car. It's not hair. It's not human hair. Have you been here? Have you been listening? Bodhi Labs has not come back with any evidence. It's not, first of all, it's not a human hair. Second of all, it's not his hair. So that is out. How do you get a fractured skull from a car accident? What injuries to his torso? What injuries to his torso? And if if all of these people were looking out the window the entire time that Karen Reed's car was there and Ryan Nagel was right behind her, how come nobody saw his body on the lawn? What are the injuries to his torso aside from the arm? And aside from his knuckles, please tell me, please. I'm just wait. I'm just going to wait. I'm waiting for it. I'm going to pull this up now so we can look at it again later, but legit, like what are the injuries to his torso? He has a fractured skull because someone beat the bejesus out of him and he fell and he slammed his head on something. He didn't have a fractured skull. Was he bending over, tying his shoe? I mean, come on, really? Really? Is that what we're doing here? Like, it's a legitimately serious question. Wow. You can't. Um, and just learned of them at that same time as, as we learned of them when uh, materials were provided pursuant to TUI. Uh, then it's a little peculiar that the exact same arguments uh, were being made throughout the pendency of the case well, well, well before uh, counsel was provided with any of those uh, federal materials. Um, what counsel just went through is essentially a list of rank speculation and not actual evidence. Um, as far as the mysterious uh, portion that's missing uh, from the, the Sally port. There's a number of different, it's, it's a motion activated camera for the most part. The other thing that I would uh, direct the court's attention to as it was contained within the state grand jury proceedings uh, is there is cruiser camera video from the Canton police cruisers. Specifically, there is cruiser camera video from cruiser 6A2. Specifically, there is cruiser camera video from cruiser 6A2 at 822 in the morning uh, when a lieutenant and sergeant from the Canton police on their own go over to One Meadows Ave, which is the, the residence of Mr. O'Keefe, to do a well-being check because they had not received any information as to how the children were or if they were there being attended to. And they pull into the driveway at 8.22 in the morning, directly behind the defendant's vehicle, which is exactly where Ms. McKay parked it when they stopped there to see if Mr. O'Keefe was there before then piling into Ms. Roberts's vehicle and proceeding to 34 Fairview. And what you can see within that cruiser camera video at 8.22 in the morning is the damage to the right rear taillight of the defendant's vehicle. Well before the defendant had then come back to the house after the hospital and then gotten in three separate cars with her family and driven in a blizzard all the way back to her parents' house in Dighton. And then the vehicle had then been towed from Dighton back to the Canton Police Station uh, by the state police with the assistance of the Dighton Police. Do you know what exhibit number that is before the grand jury? I believe it's 56, but I, I, I may be, I, I can certainly locate that information. And again, as far as Brian Albert is concerned, I, I heard nothing other than he's apparently in a well-connected family in Canton and Colin is his nephew who wasn't present at the house when Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed were present at the house. So again, I think it's a stronger argument, certainly. John O'Keefe never came in when Colin Albert wasn't there. If, heard, if heard it we're before. trying to bootstrap onto a Bowdoin defense uh, and counsel will probably likely be allowed to uh, at least investigate that as far as impeachment, cross-examination, things of that nature, but there is absolutely nothing beyond just a, a fertile imagination and rank speculation as it applies to a third-party culprit defense. And for that reason, uh, the Commonwealth's motion to exclude it should be allowed. Hi. The only thing I'd like to correct, Your Honor, is, well, or at least point out, is that 
Um, you know, the car pinged at 5.30. So hold, hold on until you get to the microphone. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the car pinged at 5.36 p.m., indicating that it was in the Sally Port. Um, there is an outdoor camera where you can see the car about to enter the, uh, the Sally Port at 5.31. Of course, you can't see the tail light in that outdoor um, you know, camera. But Mr. Lally just argued before you, well, the reason why there's no uh, you know, video of the car uh, between 508 and 550 is that it's motion activated. And I just ask the court to use common sense here that if the car is entering, and by the way, the car is there at 550 with a couple of people around it. When the, the camera comes back on, you see the car. So unless it was teleported in a split second so that the, the, the interior camera would not pick up motion, it drove into the Sally port. I believe that's the definition of motion and it should have been picked up according to Mr. Lally's own words. The okay, definition so of motion. when you walk away from the microphone, it's harder for the court reporter to hear you, Ms. Gianetti. Please, good. I, I Let me come back, I'll say it again. It, it's, um, you know, according to Mr. Lally's own words, it should have picked up the movement. Okay. No. All right. So I believe that's the last motion. So why don't we recess until two o'clock? And I'll see you back here at two. Mr. Lally, will you have uh, Ms. Gilman, who I did see walk in here at one point, set up the screen Oops. right where we normally keep it? Yes, sir. Right, thank you. You are muted. You are muted. All right. So then it goes into the afternoon. Is there anything? Well, I thought maybe since we're here, we could pull up a picture of uh, Nebercracker. <laughs> Let's, uh, this is Nebercracker. Get off my lawn guy. From whenever that movie is. And that's what they call John. Thanks, Nosy. I was like, oh my God, I've been sitting on a plane all day. I'm like, Shoulders are killing me and it's four hours. How much more of this is in the afternoon? Because we watched the video. There's really not that much more left. We can, uh, there's really not much more left at all. I think after the video, we'll go back for a second because I, I, I'm confused at this point as to Monster House. That's the name of this video. <laughs> um, I'm confused as to what's been granted, what's been denied. I still don't know. I still don't know if she's ruled on anything. I'm not seeing it in the court in the court docket. Here's his after he plays the video that we went over earlier portion. Can I get that for the weekend as well? Oh, absolutely. And, and for the record, as far as I, I think a lot of that sort of preliminary stuff was more meant as context for the court. Um, you know, okay. there's certain discussions about court procedure and things that I, I don't think should be put in front of the jury. Uh, all right. So that that was my concern as well. Um, OK, so it's something I'll watch a few times and um, the whole thing as well. OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you. For identification. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Okay, so housekeeping matters. Uh, a few things Wait, is that this are real. Is this surreal? J one C eighty. Lauren Lane is actually Elizabeth Proctor in here, trolling, grasping at straws because she knows her hubby. The detective Mike. Oh, is that true? If it is, did you did you wind up getting the gift? Did you get the gift that uh, somebody wanted to give to your husband? If that's true, I'm just wondering if you got the gift. Was anything good? I don't know if that's true or not, but. Bug mom, if you have the facts on your side, pound the facts. If you have the law on your side, pound the law. If you have neither or the law or the facts on your side, pound the table. Alex <laughs> pounding the table. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the gift was. I don't even know if that's even true. <laughs> Brandy's like, oh my God, I just laughed so loud that I scared my dog. I don't know. Was it like, was it something good or was it like one of those crappy like gift baskets from like one of those places where you wouldn't even want to eat the sausage that was in there? Like the, you know, that, that, you know, those baskets that people used to send like for Christmas that weren't really good. Yeah. 
still need, as you know, to before we have yeah, the jury here on Tuesday. Segment. Yeah, I need right, to state let's forget the this. case. Uh, let's forget this and let's go to that because that you're right. That is fire and it's short, so we can watch it quickly together just for a parting interesting uh thing to see what is going on out there in the world of if you want to even call it mainstream media because i don't even know if you do want to call it that but um i'm gonna find it for you because i saw it and i was like okay and you guys can just tell me what you think i'm not even gonna i'm not even gonna comment on it i'm just gonna play it straight through and i'm just gonna let you guys i'm gonna let you guys do the commentating on this Hmm, I'm just gonna find it. Okay, and and actually, what it's entitled, if you go on the Court TV website, it's entitled "We Will Never Forget Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman." That is what she claims this video is about. But as you'll see, it's not because she's talking about Karen Reed for part of it. So she didn't want to put that in the title, I guess, because uh, you know the chat gets a little crazy. I mean, I still don't know what she's granted and what she hasn't. So we'll have to go over that maybe tomorrow when we go over the document drop. Let's do that tomorrow. But uh, this is. Um... Here we go. In Florida, you just saw her there. Defendant Sarah Boone is set to appear in court at 9 a.m. Eastern time. She's got a status hearing on front ahead of her upcoming murder trial set to start next week. We're going to go there live together in our next hour when Court TV Live begins. And in Colorado, we've got Nicholas Jordan. He'll be in court at 1 p.m. Eastern today for a preliminary hearing. He's accused of killing two people, including his roommate, on a Colorado Springs college campus. We begin this morning by getting all ready for this morning's final hearing before Karen Reed's murder trial, as the judge is expected to rule on dozens of motions to either allow in or to exclude case evidence. This week, the judge also agreed to the Boston Globe's request to unseal some of the documents relating to the defense's failed motion to dismiss. Investigators say Reed hit and killed her boyfriend, police officer John O'Keefe, with her SUV. Her lawyers are claiming that there's a cover-up with the investigation. The U.S. attorney confirmed during that conference call, confirmed for both parties, that not only has there been a federal investigation of this case, but it is ongoing. It's not over. It continues. The DA had this confirmed for them just yesterday, right from the horse's mouth. That means, Your Honor, that District Attorney Morrissey and his office are targets of a federal investigation. And please consider what that means. Now, as her case heads to trial, the most important question is, will there be justice for the victim, John O'Keefe? That's what I want to know. I have two outstanding guests on the program this morning. Let's bring them in now. One of them is an attorney in Boston. That's our friend Wendy Murphy. She's also a law professor. She's been a prosecutor. She does a lot of civil rights work now. She's also an author of the book, Oh No, He Did It. And we have with us law professor and trial attorney Dante Mills. And Dante, I've got to congratulate you. You teach at Temple University School of Law that was just ranked number one in the nation by U.S. News and World Report for trial advocacy. So I know you're really proud of that. Uh, let's really tap into your legal experience, both of you, please, as law professors. The first thing I want to ask you about is this motion from prosecutors to preclude Karen Reed from raising a third party defense. Ladies first, please. Wendy Murphy, would you start us off? What do you think about this? No, it's not... Um unanticipated that they would <clears throat> um, seek to do this, but I'm not, I'm just not sure it matters very much because even if all the evidence comes in and, and we've heard it over and over again, that Karen believes some of the person did it and there's a conspiracy to cover up the true culprit. Um, there's really no there there. So I'm, I'm inclined to say, just let it in so that the jury can think to itself, what a bunch of bozos this defense team is trying to suggest that anyone else but Karen Reed did this because the evidence against Karen Reed is so overwhelming. Now, having said that, there is a body of law in Massachusetts, and I'm sure it's similar in other states, that uh, forbids the defense to falsely accuse 
a third party of committing a crime where there is no evidence. And so I think there's actually a really good chance the judge is going to forbid them from raising this defense in general. And now remember, the defense hasn't said it's not Karen, it is John Doe. They haven't identified a specific suspect. Um, but just the idea that it's some unknown culprit, I think the judge in this case will be inclined to say, you can't raise this as a defense because you have zero evidence that anybody but Karen Reed killed John O'Keefe. Except for what was revealed during the federal proffer. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. Mm -hmm. Great point, Wendy. Uh, yeah, you know, look, we're all ears here. You know, be specific. You know, the idea that, oh, he, he was just killed at this party. Well, there were 12 people or something in that house. Who did what? You're saying that all of these people and then everybody after the fact, the paramedics, the lawyers, everybody after the fact engaged in this grand conspiracy. Um, when, as you said, Wendy, there's a mountain of evidence against her that we're going to be seeing real soon here. Uh, Dante Mills, uh, the third party uh, defense, if they are able to raise this. Um, how successful do you think this is going to be uh, if, if they're not specific? As I was saying, if they, if they don't uh, very clearly lay out how uh, their alternative theory uh, should win here. I, I can tell you this. They've already raised it. Yes, they are in front of the judge uh, and the prosecutor is asking them not to be able to bring it up in court, but there's nobody that's going to be in that courtroom that has not heard of this alternative person theory. Now, you do want to be able to, you can't just have smoke and mirrors. You have to have some kind of proof. I think they have enough there. There's, there's things that they can point to, like um, the, the, the injuries um, that he suffered that were not consistent with a car. Something as simple as that. He gets it. Dante Mills. And I disagree with him on the Daniel Penny case, but I think I'm going to agree with what he has to say here. That should allow them to say, Karen Reed could not have done this. It had to be somebody else. They don't have to go and name the person who did it. They just have to point to things that should suggest that she didn't. And it's a it's really a fine line because if the judge precludes all of that evidence, if a defendant can't come in and say, I believe somebody else did this, if they have any type of evidence to point to, I think that's limiting their defense. And that opens up this whole entire prosecution to appeal and if the prosecutor believes they have enough on Karen Reed, I don't know if they want to open themselves up to that appeals process unnecessarily. So really, why are they arguing that heavy against this if they believe it's all smoke and mirrors anyway? And if they believe that strongly in their case, they may want to protect themselves against appeal. Dante, thank you for that. Uh, let's take a look at some of the text messages uh, between John O'Keefe and Karen Reed showing the timeline uh, surrounding, oh, I'm sorry, this is between, here's what we're gonna look at. Let's look at this first. Let's look at the text between Jennifer McCabe and John O'Keefe. Um, so we know that they're all at this bar in Boston and then the idea is let's go back um, to the house of the Alberts. And these are all John O'Keefe's good friends. That's one thing that's really important to understand. All of these people, the people, the ladies that Karen Reed called upon in the wee hours of the morning when she was drunk and hysterical, uh, all of that, these are her boyfriend's friends, not her friends. And um, so they're asking for directions to the house and we know that they arrive there. The question is, as you look at this, does he go in the house? The state is saying, Wendy Murphy, that there is zero evidence Thank you. that he entered that home. If they can establish that at trial, do they win this case? Well, I'm not sure. There's zero evidence that he went in the house. There's overwhelming evidence that he was killed by Karen Reed's car in front of the house. Um, this notion that he went into the house as somehow proof that someone else killed him, um, because it's such a bold claim and there is zero support for it. I mean, for example, everyone in the house agrees that he never went in. There is no physical evidence that he went in. Um, there is overwhelming evidence that he never left the area where his body uh, was found. Um, if the if the only thing the defense has is some cockamamie technology uh, data that uh, is is 
not remotely specific to where his body was, there, there's a real chance that they could irritate the jury by assuming they're stupid. I mean, when you put on a dumb defense and then you try to get the jury to believe it and they're like, what? You know, this makes absolutely no sense. Once you insult the jury by making a claim that's wild and ridiculous, they can turn against your client with a vengeance and find her guilty, even if they might have been inclined to have some compassion for her, because they don't like to be insulted. And that's why this idea that there's any proof he went into the house, much less that someone else killed him, is such a dangerous defense. Yeah, you can whip the crowd into a frenzy out front of the courthouse and try to get the public you know, protesting, but there's a very different strategy now. You gotta win in front of a jury. They have no hope if this is their defense. In fact, I think they're more likely to lose if they promote this idea. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point, um, Wendy, because of all the evidence found in the lawn, outside the house, pieces of the cocktail glass he was holding in her tail light, microscopic pieces of her tail light in his clothing, no dog DNA whatsoever found on his body. There was the big dog theory prior to this. Uh, I hear your point. It's an excellent one. Uh, Dante, I want to pick your brain about something. How long was the clothing uh, in the back seat of Proctor's car before it was turned into evidence? How many weeks? A little taint going on there. A little, uh, oh my, a little chain of custody issue. I don't know. I'm just saying. Anything else? Um, the Reed defense team has really gone hard on all of these police officers who were friends of John O'Keefe. They were all very close friends with him. And uh, they're going so far as to try to get their cell phone record. I know, Maureen, but I just want you to see what people out there who watch T Court TV are seeing. This is what they're seeing. And something that happened at the last hearing was kind of surprising. You know, the way the Reed defense team sort of, um, you know, couched it for, for everybody in the public was that, oh, nobody wants to turn over their records. Let's listen to what Brian Albert's attorney told the judge. Brian Albert does not object to turning over the materials that are being requested. I understand that the Commonwealth may be having objections as to the Commonwealth's case, but Brian Albert does not have anything to hide. He does not have anything that he needs to, uh, to prevent the court from seeing this material. And if the court does deem, after reviewing the material and having access to the federal records, that these are somehow relevant or that these are somehow admissible, and the court deems that Rule 17 has been satisfied, Brian Albert will comply with the court order. That, that was the theme of that hearing, Dante. It was just, yeah, take it. I mean, we think it's an intrusion on our privacy, but if the court's so inclined, take it. I can't wait to see all of these officers on the stand. Uh, Dante, do you think it's possible that the Reed defense team here is underestimating these police witnesses? No, and, and I wanna talk about this because we are, your guest talked about um, the importance of putting forward a theory and how it can turn a jury against you. But Julie, you mentioned in your opening statement about the OJ Simpson case, right? That case that had all the evidence in the world against OJ Simpson, his attorneys put forward a theory that the entire investigation should be thrown out the window because one officer was racist and the jury did. So when you're a defense attorney, you don't have to prove anything. All you have to do is put forward enough to make the jury question the validity of anything that has to be proven by the prosecution. And if they can do that by saying somehow, sending, showing a text that may be questionable from one of the uh, police officers to, to somebody else, if they can do that by saying the cell phone uh, coverage that puts him inside that house, what does that mean? Why are they lying about him being in there? It works for them. Otherwise, what is their defense? What are they gonna do? So they have the right to put forward a defense. They have the obligation to put forward a defense. They don't have to prove anything. All they have to do is create enough doubt. And these little things, they may not mean anything individually, but if they can convince one person on that jury that one of those little things means the case is not proven beyond a reasonable doubt, they win. Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, fair point, fair point, Dante. Uh, absolutely, I agree with you. Um, one thing I will say that's interesting for those who've really paid close attention to this one, the defense has changed. When just David Yannetti was representing Karen Reed at one of the earliest hearings, it might've even been her first court appearance, and he was speaking to the issue of bond. He said something to the effect of, judge, this wasn't an intentional act here. This doesn't rise to the level. Yeah, because they were told there was video of John of Karen hitting John with her car. They were told they had a video. Come on now. Full of manslaughter. She didn't act with any intent. She loved him. Essentially, you know, people could draw the inference that, oh, this was an accident, an accident that she hit him with her car, if she did. And then Alan Jackson came in, and now the defense has changed to she didn't hit him 
it was somebody else who did this and made it all look like she did. Um, I can't wait till this hearing starts. It's going to start at 9 a.m. this morning. We'll go in there live. And I'm so glad we have Dante Mills and Wendy Murphy sticking with us as we head to what's. Yeah, oh, that was the day of the hearing. So I just I don't know how many of you saw that, but it made me. Uh, whew. All right, my friends, this has been a, a long four and a half hours. I didn't realize it was going to take this long to do this tonight, but uh, I'm glad that we did. I'm glad that you joined me. And I'd like to just go to the chat for a minute. And thank you all for, for doing this and being in here with me. And I need to thank everyone. All right, hang on a second here and answer some questions before we go. Just got to see where we left off before. And... Sandy B, yes, during the hearing. Sorry, when third party, I think we covered that earlier. Thanks for your super chat. Thank you, Sarah, for your super chat. Awesome shows of late. Looking forward to the trial. I think we all are. I think we all are ready for this to happen. We've been covering this for a very long time. And where are we? Where are we? Where are you, Sarah? Jewel, thanks for your super sticker. Cynthia, thanks for your super sticker. Free Karen Reed. Cynthia says, intolerant. The Karen haters all say the dog bite defense has been debunked. Is that true? Intolerant. Uh, I think they are claiming, thanks for your super chat, that the clothing was tested at some animal DNA lab <clears throat> and that there was no canine DNA found on the clothing. I haven't seen the report from that, but again, where was the clothing? What happened to the clothing during the time that it was not logged into evidence, we don't know. And I think that's going to be some reasonable doubt if that is what the report says, that there's DNA on the clothing. I don't know. That there's no dog DNA on the clothing. I'm sure they'll have an expert too. You know, it'll be better of the experts on a lot of this stuff too. And I don't even know if that's true, that that's what that report says, because we heard Lally tell us what that video was going to show. And then we saw exactly what that video showed and it had nothing to do with what Lally said it was going to show. Latin, Latina, Latina, thanks for your super chat. Why didn't Yanetti say that's not, was say audio? Why didn't the judge call out Laddie, Lally about the video? I don't know. That's a great point because if, if uh, Yanetti or Jackson said, here's what the video is going to show and it showed that, she would have called them out in my opinion. Wicked Sight, thanks for your super chat. I've never seen an investigator tell a potential suspect to stop talking before until that clip the state just showed. Yeah. Thanks, Connecticut girl, for becoming a member. And Macbeth, I have questions. In your 30 years of practicing law, have you ever seen a judge baby a prosecutor like we are seeing in this case? It happens. It happens. But this is this is kind of, I mean, we're, we're all seeing it, right? So it's, I think we can all agree what we see. Thanks for your super chat. Thank you for your super chat to Wenty. Uh, take a shot every time Lally says, essentially, yeah, we got to get those bingo cards ready. Boston Day JD, thanks so much for gifting five memberships. Suzanne, thank you. Suzanne says, my prediction is the feds will step in once the jury is sworn in. This will ensure that Massachusetts cannot retry her under double jeopardy. Yeah, that's what I've been saying too. Thanks for your five bucks. Oh, Gaylin, thank you for a, a, a gifting 10 memberships. That is so generous of you. You're always so generous. Madam Ross, thanks for the super chat. Uh, super sticker, pink is now our color of silent protest. I'd like to know how many of you guys are going to be there on Tuesday. Melissa, thank you so much for your super chat. Prosecution just seems nosy. 1773, Boston Tea Party 2024. Boston, spill the tea party. I like it. I like it. Stephanie, thank you for gifting five memberships. Congratulations to everyone who got them. Emmy, thanks for being a member for four months. Best chat on YouTube. Thanks, Melanie and Moz. Moz, you guys are amazing. We are outraged. Thanks for your super chat. This could be such a defining case for this judge. Yeah. And it may be her little, um, her last criminal trial. Linda, thanks for being a member for a month. Uh, she says, thank you, Melanie, for covering this trial and all the others. It really helps when you break things down, especially when the volume is low. Linda Lee, thanks for becoming a member. Sarah Harvey, three months in the Maya trial, all counsel and the judge smiled a lot more frequently. That is true. Uh, Kylie H, thanks for your super chat. Will they have feds on the witness list? Defense, they may. We'll see. 
I can't wait to see that witness list. Casey, thank you for thanking me for all that I do. I appreciate you. Michelle, thanks for your super chat. Anyone else get a weird vibe when Bev takes a break right in the middle of Yanetti's, uh, regarding Hig <laughs> Yanetti's fire regarding Higgins? Like she had to make a quick phone call. That's what I said. I said what I said. Sandy B, five bucks. So what about the undetermined cause of death as opposed to no liability found? I don't think she ruled on that yet. Tell me. True crime junkie, the OG. Thanks for being a member for two months. Maybe some of these motion decisions, uh, the decisions will drop tomorrow and we can look at them tomorrow before Tuesday. Joanne says on fire, your lipstick on fire. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Joanne, for the super chat. And wicked psyched for another one. Why would a prosecution fear evidence? Good point. Aren't they about getting to the truth and finding out who killed John O'Keefe instead of trying to, I mean, maybe they had confirmation bias from the beginning and they wanted it to believe it was Karen and that's the way they went. That's what some people think. Scott, thanks so much for your 10 bucks. House was never investigated. Witness statements taken over various times, days, weeks, state grand jury testimony don't match. Federal grand jury testimony don't match. Any of the above, all lies, a cover up 100% all day. Thank you for that, Suzanne. Thank you again. Caitlin Ann is the blonde lady and she's amazing. Oh, the one in court sitting behind you, Nettie. Uh, Melanie, you're so entertaining. Thank you, Leah. I have barely any voice left, but I've been, and I've been on traveling all day. I was on two airplanes, I'm like planes, trains, and automobile. Uh, Bob Jones, thank you so much for your super chat. Super sticker, Christine became a member. Yay. Bob Jones, thanks again for another super chat. Aunt Bev didn't even think Higgins was a witness three weeks ago. He was in your house. He is the killer, Bev. Yeah, remember? She's like, well, wait, was he even a witness at this time? What do you mean, Brian Higgins? What do you mean? Yeah. We did. We talked about that. That was a fun one. Wicked Psych, thanks again. Lally, Lally, Lally loves his adjectives. He does. This is Jim Morrison. Thank you for your super chat. I appreciate your commitment, your coverage for justice for jo Officer John O'Keefe and Karen's freedom. Karen Reed could be any one of us, my friends, and that's why this is frightening to me. Thank you, Kyle Lilly, for the $10 super chat. Love you, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, Lisa got thanks for the uh, super chat. Again, Jay Coffin D asked, where is Higgins? She knew he was gone. He was trying to be Turtle Boy. She was trying to be TB for CW and failed gloriously. I know I was going to pull up that clip. When I was on court TV with her, that's what she said. Where's Higgins? Where's Brian Higgins? Where's Brian Higgins? And all this. So she must have known something was happening. That was, I think, back in January, that show that I did on court TV. Alexandra, thank you for the super chat. And it's your first time seeing this. Oh, my gosh. I think I have about 50 hours of coverage now on this case. Go back. There's a whole playlist if you want to start from the beginning. Uh, I don't know if you can binge it all by Tuesday, but there should be some time in between because jury selection is going to be Tuesday and then they're going to shut the cameras down until it is done. So that could be a whole week at least until the trial starts, the real trial part starts. Thank you, uh, MJ Gaglio, for your 20 bucks. Karen Karma 2024, I like it. Kim W., thank you. We love you, Karen Reed, and your family. Thank you for the super chat and love a nurse. I want to thank you as well for your super sticker. And to all of the kind friends who bought me coffee, Amber with the Venmo, thank you so much. And B Ann with the Venmo, thank you so much. And Joshua for the Venmo, thank you so much. You're amazing. Deanna, thank you for the Venmo. Elizabeth Dalton, thank you. Janelle, thanks for buying me three coffees. Janelle, you're always, you know how much coffee I need, girl. And uh, you guys are really, really, Emmy, thank you much, much, very much for the Venmo. And uh, Justin for the cash app and Paige for the coffee. And you guys are really, really, really the most generous group of, of fans that I have. And I just, I couldn't have this channel without you. And uh, thank you for tolerating my voice for four and a half hours. And hopefully we learn something. And happy Patriots Day to everyone tomorrow and Boston Marathon. And I hope a lot of you have off work tomorrow so that we can maybe come back and do a little bit of a catch up on the document drop because there is some more information in there that we should look at. And uh, hopefully there'll be some decisions that we can look at tomorrow. And to all of my friends who send me emails with the documents and with articles and stuff to cover. I love it. Keep it common. If anybody wants to put up the email, fanbase at mlittlelaw.com. I don't even know if any of the mods are still here, but thank you to the mods. They they work so hard, you guys. They really work so hard to keep it classy here. And we try to make it a safe place for everybody. Every now and then a troll sneaks in and what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I mean, really just show me some evidence that he was hit by a car. Just anything. I don't know. I just, I don't see it. I just can't, I can't see it based on all of the evidence that we've looked at together. So it's, um, 
cray. It's just cray. And it's going to be a bumpy ride. So buckle up. Thank you again to my moderators. You guys are awesome. Channel members, the viewers, the replay viewers, hit the like button so that this will be pushed out there in the YouTube universe and people can actually watch it and uh, and learn like we've been learning and analyze. Some legal you know, analysis will be uh, appreciated. Thank you, Monica, for <laughs> asking me to relax after the college where I am. I'm all stressed out. I'm like, oh, it's going to cost a lot of money. I have twins. Oh, thank you, Monica. I appreciate that. Um, you guys, this is crazy. I can't believe it's gotten this far. I can't wait to see what happens. I know you're going to be here with me. Thank you, little cupcake for putting this up. Yeah. Share the stream. If you like it and you like what you see and you like it here, share the stream. I think I'm going to go gavel to gavel on this. You guys, I think I'm going to do it. It'll be the first time that I'm going to do a trial of gavel to gavel, but I'm here for it. I'm so invested in this trial and I have learned, I have, I know everything about it. So Maybe there's going to be stuff we don't know. And I think I need to cover it gavel to gavel. So that will start when the trial starts Tuesday. I will be here for you. We'll do it live. And I think at least we'll get a good stream because we'll have some quality coverage. So everyone says, have a great weekend. Today is Sunday, isn't it? All right, everyone, remember, I mean, be cool, be kind, be classy. Really, it is so not hard. It is so not hard. Please. Thank you. See you guys soon. Tomorrow. Hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you'll know when. Good night.